Uh, well, it's, we've had a really fun semester. Um, uh, it's been such a treat to get to teach with Gina and to work with this incredible group of students. Um, our investigation this semester has been uh, focused on Franklin Park, which um, obviously agency uh, and uh, Reed Hildebrand are working on. So we've uh, had a chance to chat with um, the real team, the real design team uh, throughout the semester in a variety of different formats. Um, we started the semester looking at uh, current contemporary master plans and students um, analyzed these and diagrammed them to learn a set of tactics that other designers were using for large parks. Um, from that analysis, uh, then we turned our gaze to Franklin Park, um, studying it uh, and its layers um, at our desks, and then visiting for a pretty incredible but slightly rainy five days in Boston. Um, and uh, we toured on foot and toured around in our uh, landscape van and um, met uh, a lot of designers and um, other experts in their offices and, and generally had a really good time. Mm -hmm. um, and then we came back to studio and uh, started to translate some of the tactics that we saw in um, our master plan analysis uh, to developing frameworks for change. Um, and this was really intentionally about developing a set of framework tactics um, based in an ethical position rather than an overall master plan that would redesign the entire, every inch of the park. Um, and that's where we sort of landed at spring break when um, the world uh, changed for us. Um, and so remotely over the last six weeks, um, students have been testing and exploring and further developing their designs um, into focus areas that are grounded in their framework proposals. And um, those have included body scale design explorations as well as sort of larger connective um, moves. And that's what you'll see today. Throughout mm -hmm. the semester, we've also had a series of conversations um, about the role of feminist theory in design and how that may or may not uh, impact design moves and design practice. Um, talking about ideas of an ethic of care, um, body experience of space, ideas of safety, and also issues of equity and uh, larger social connections. And you'll see threads of those conversations appearing in the work and um, particularly within the framing of uh, individual projects. Um, it's been a really fun semester and I, I feel really excited that I got a chance to work with each of these students and further my own thinking about design through our conversation. So I'm, I'm mostly just really grateful uh, that everyone stepped up in some challenging circumstances and also mm -hmm. took on a really challenging project. Beautiful introduction, Maggie. Yeah, I can't say it enough, although I'm sure we'll come back at the end of the conversation today to talk about and reflect on the semester, which has been just incredibly beautiful. So thank you all. I'm very excited for you to share your work because we just what we've seen recently is just exceptional. Um, and I, maybe just a word of introduction. I think everyone knows Hope. So that's Hope, um, one of my faculty once upon a time and now ruler of the world down there in, at UT. And thanks Hope for having me. Um, Kristen Fredrickson, who's a principal at Reed Hildebrand. You guys haven't met her. She wasn't at the office visit, um, but she has been teaching. How many times have you taught Franklin Park as a studio site, Kristen? Just twice, twice. Just yeah. twice, just twice. But, um, <laughs> and then getting to work on the real master plan. So I think there probably is no greater expert on how to think about Franklin Park. And she's also a feminist. So yeah, you have that built in as well. Okay. And then uh, the other feminist today. <laughs> <laughs> my business, my business partner Bree, who's an urban planner um, and a principal and co-founder with me of um, agency. And prior to that, we were both principals at Sasaki together, where we worked for ten years before starting agency. Um, and you just finished a semester-long studio, as you do every year, at teaching within the urban planning program at Harvard. What was your your subject area? Was Lowell? 
Massachusetts? Yes. Uh, so our, our students this semester, I teach in the um, Master's in Urban Planning program, and they were focused on neighborhood plans. So it's, uh, they were doing some community engagement, which of course was um, challenging after the first half of, of the semester. And so lots of kind of thinking about those dimensions and then digging into um, neighborhoods in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is uh, notable because it's very close to the um, birthplace of Gina Ford. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, Jack Kerouac. So you have that. <laughs> that um, <too. laughs> well, with that, i um, just so excited to see the work and um, very enthusiastic to start with V. <laughs> and um, how long, how long do we have per student, Maggie, we said 30 minutes? Yeah, we said half an hour um, total. So each student is going to present for seven to 10 minutes and then uh, the rest of the time will be conversation. Okay, my best to present everything in 10 minutes. Do it V, take us away, kick I've us been off. I'm practicing, but it's a lot, it's a lot of information. Um, Thank you, uh, Bree, Kristen, and Hope, and everybody for being here. Um, let's see. Let me put this in full screen. Okay. So my name is V, and my project is called The Exchange at Franklin Park. Um, due to this unprecedented time that we now all live in, it has become apparent that our perception of parks has and will change forever. As our day-to-day -day lives have shifted dramatically, so will the way we see and use our parks. Um, so I began my analysis of Franklin Park through a programmatic lens. And sorry, I'm trying to like minimize the video in my way. <laughs> um, so I was looking at Franklin Park through a programmatic lens and immediately I started identifying multiple barriers. Um, so these are a series of cross sections that are taken uh, through the eastern edge of the park. And these uh, barriers present visual and physical barriers. Um, looking at the impervious cover uh, coupled with the private program, uh, there's really hardly any public space left in Franklin Park. Um, and so I started looking at the informal, uh, I started looking at the informal program of the park. And I guess going into this project, I had this misconception, or maybe we all had this misconception that there wasn't really much going on at Franklin, but through research, I started to um, find all of these social and cultural events that are hosted by the community and they're taking place in these leftover pockets of Franklin Park and these nodes. And so in these images, you can see how the community is actually utilizing these informal areas. And there's hardly any structure, as you can see from these images, you know, people are gathering on the sidewalk, they're having to use the private golf course or pop up a structure to have a concert series in the winter or in the summertime. And I also started mapping out the parades in and around Boston and um, in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. And two of these major parades uh, actually end in Franklin Park. And so to me, that seemed like a cry from the community saying like, hey, you know, we love Franklin Park, we value Franklin Park, it's our cultural stage, but we really need this infrastructure. Um, and so, the conclusion to my analysis is that Franklin has become this cultural stage and social stage for the community, but um, in those leftover pockets of the park, the design just does not reflect that at all. So you can see here an informal gathering that happens just outside of the golf course clubhouse um, on the eastern edge of the park. Um, so my vision for this project was to essentially break down the barriers that have historically isolated Franklin from the surrounding neighborhood and give back park access that's been stripped away over the last century. And my methodology behind this is by uh, is to legitimize these areas of interest by improving access and inclusivity, while also providing the necessary infrastructure to promote these uh, events and um, celebrations to happen throughout the seasons. So. 
for my framework project, which Maggie mentioned we completed a few weeks ago, um, I broke Franklin down into four big chunks. Um, and these, as you may have noticed, are those leftover spaces where the community had sort of taken over and started utilizing them for informal gatherings. And I characterized them based on um, how people use them. And through a series of these sketchy renderings, I started illustrating and investigating what those would look like if they had infrastructure and if they were actually built out. Um, and so along with the framework plan came a series of infrastructural changes. Um, for instance, the circulation has changed where Circuit Drive, which is that very um, uh, heavy, very like busy road that cuts through the park is converted into a shared street. So kind of emphasizing the role of pedestrians again. Um, introducing a meadow walk that skirts through the park um, from the eastern edge all the way to Schoolmaster Hill, which is that Olmstedian ruin. A consolidation of the parking uh, to below grade parking. And then lastly, converting half of the golf course uh, into a restored meadow. And you can see that clearly outlined as number two on my future development plan. And at the end of my framework, I had decided to take on this area, which I've named the exchange, um, mostly because of how challenging of a site it was and how difficult it was for people to access the park on this eastern edge. And I'm also looking at Blue Hill Avenue, which is this cultural and um, uh, commercial corridor that runs through Mattapan, Dorchester, Roxbury. Um, so taking a closer look at that site, it's about 13 acres um, in total. Uh, there's just a few things that I want to note. Uh, obviously, it's pretty car dominated. There's lots of roads, uh, sub or surface parking, uh, as well as the uh, very large <laughs> golf course clubhouse, which blocks that amazing view down into that valley. Um, and then also, I wanted to note this uh, historic geometry that is has survived the 120 years that Franklin has been around. Um, it's this circular roundabout, as well as that very orthogonal uh, zoo geometry that Olmsted had proposed back in the day. Uh, I also wanted to just note out the current uses, which uh, first is that parade uh, termination. Basically, that Southern parade comes this way, that Northern parade comes this way, and they terminate the parades in this little roundabout right here. Uh, there's an informal gathering space in the shady lawn area, as well as an informal gathering space in the parking lot where people have started to use it as a car washing station. Um, and so just looking at the topography, I noted a couple of the low points. Uh, just wanted to point out this very steep terrain as well as a peak right here. Um, these will definitely play a role in my site design. And I started looking at the design through um, a series of gestural parties. And this one is about, my phone is beeping. Um, my, this uh, party is about um, an embrace. It symbolizes the community extending into Franklin and Franklin embracing the community. And of course, bringing in those ecologies, uh, beautiful ecologies from the park all the way to the edge of the street. And so through a series of uh, drawings, you can see pretty early on that I'm experimenting with this curvilinear geometry that snakes around that massive hill that I identified, as well as um, this very strong orthogonal uh, promenade that I'm extending from the zoo. Um, so essentially, I'm trying to establish a language between these two conflicting geometries, but it all kind of came together when I started modeling in clay. Thank you, Hope. Um, and so essentially you can break it down into three landscape acts. And the first one being the deconstruction of that corner on Blue Hill and Circuit Drive. The shaping of the hill, which then becomes this Belvedere slash lookout into Dorchester and into the golf course. And then shaping that again into an auditorium on the backside and setting up that view into that restored meadow and golf course beyond. And so you can break that down even further by saying, okay, the first act is a spillway plaza. The second one is a hill, which signals like you've arrived. 
and then the third being this auditorium. And so this is my final site plan for the project. And you can see very clearly that uh, curvilinear gesture coming forward, uh, spilling into the community and pulling the community into the park all the way to this uh, entryway to the meadow walk that takes you all the way to um, the Schoolmaster Hill uh, ruin. And essentially the space can be divided into three plazas. Um, the first one being Muriel Plaza, which is this urban plaza. The second one being um, the Overlook Plaza, which is working in tandem with that hillside. And then lastly, the Grand Dame Plaza. I've also included um, a pollinator garden that would work in tandem with the after school programs as like an educational after school program for the children that go to the zoo. Um, I've included another meadow on this edge to increase the ferocity and the visibility into that plaza, but also to ensure that people are safe from cars. Um, and then I've also included this Eastern white pine forest trail that winds through that very steep terrain and takes you through this magical experience through the pines. And in section, which is taken right here, um, you can understand the hierarchy of the plazas and how they're working in a most enclosed fashion all the way down to a least enclosed fashion. And zooming in a little closer into those plazas, um, the first one being Muriel Plaza, I imagine as this very porous urban plaza that mediates the edge of the street and the park. It's also a spillway for those parades and events that happen along this corridor. Um, and I've also included a cafe with bathrooms. We noticed right away when we were visiting Franklin that there are like no public bathrooms. So of course, um, adding that, integrating seating along the hillside and along that um, meadow that uh, shapes the edge of the, of the street as well as the plaza itself. And then just kind of looking at how these plazas can shape to the needs of the community. So imagining, you know, what that would look like on a market day or on a winter day where the community has like a winter festival and they wanted to incorporate ice skating or something like that. And then of course, realizing that this is a safe and democratic social space that promotes equity and inclusivity and allows people to have beliefs and share those beliefs and voice their beliefs publicly and in a safe way. And then this is looking at that straight axis that takes you from Blue Hill all the way to the zoo and just seeing how that promenade can be utilized by many people and many cultures and transform based on the needs of the community. And this is a section through uh, that promenade as well as Blue Hill Avenue and it out illustrates that continuous park experience beyond the borders of the park. And then lastly, looking at Grand Dame Plaza, which is that um, last plaza that opens up to that immense view into the restored meadow. I've also included a cafe with bathrooms and a smaller seating area, but of course I, I envision this as a more um, flexible open space. It's connected to that very large uh, auditorium lawn and connects to the meadow walk right here. And I wanted to just uh, see what that would look like if they, if people wanted to have like a movie night or something along those lines. And then of course, imagining what it would look like if parades were actually able to continue down that corridor um, and through the park and back out onto Blue Hill. And so seeing this become a spillover area for people um, when they're celebrating their culture. Um, so I'm actually gonna finish out on this slide and it's actually one of the earliest drawings I made, but it embodies uh, the vision most accurately, I think. And that is that um, this project is mainly about people and it's about breaking down barriers and realizing the potential of Franklin to serve and represent its community. And that is, my last presentation ever. <laughs> Thank you. As a student, V. As a student <laughs> at UT. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you.
is it is it possible to like scroll back into a slide that sort of shows the whole project so that maybe can just kind of now that we've gone through it under try to understand it. And and just in terms of you've uh, you've removed all the parking and that's happening below grade somewhere, yeah. and the mm -hmm. um, you've removed the golf clubhouse and that is mm -hmm. rebuilt in another location. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. Sorry, I did not specify, but I my intentions were to move the golf course to um, the other side, basically just like diagonally across. Got it. Okay, um, I need some golf course updates too. So uh, you're you're going from 18 to nine holes, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, who, is it a 99 year lease or are, is it a public or private golf club? It's a public golf club. Um, the reason why I didn't remove it entirely is because it generates a lot of revenue um, I looked into this months ago, so I don't remember the numbers exactly, but I couldn't find a good enough reason to remove it entirely because these public amenities at the park will actually help the park continue. Um, you know, okay, no, I'm not taking an anti-golf course stance. I just yeah. wanted, to, you know, I mean, I live near two nine-hole golf courses that are beloved. Mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. To know that it's nine holes is fine. I just wanted mm -hmm. to know more about, you know, the clubhouse and how feasible it is to demolish and relocate. That was it was just a yeah. point of clarification. Mm -hmm. I have one more uh, point yeah. of uh, question for clarification. Will you sure. explain how the northern uh, parade arrives in your mm -hmm. parade ground and then how the southern parade arrives in the parade ground? Yeah, so right now the Southern and Northern Parade Grounds, uh, you know, they come from Blue Hill. The Southern one, I guess, makes this crazy uh, 35 degree turn or whatever that is um, and makes its way into that, uh, into that roundabout, which I've removed um, entirely. But the Northern one has a much more seamless uh, mode or turn into that area. But my proposal is that they can come from either direction. So they can come, and I apologize that this plan got cut off, but ideally the Southern parades would have a much easier time getting in from that Southern um, entrance when that road is actually pulled all the way through and creates a much more seamless curve. So the Northern parades come from this way, the Southern parades come from that way. And where do they, come where, I called it a parade ground. Where is the contemporary parade ground in your plan? Well, I think it's kind of everywhere. Um, I don't think that there is one specific termination point for the parades. I think that this one becomes one of the termination points and this becomes another because there's so many floats that come through at a time. You wanna make sure that people can disperse accordingly. Um, so these are both kind of the spillover spaces for those for the termination of the parades. And it's a very wide road. Okay. All right. I guess I'll start. I, okay, one thing I would have enjoyed when you were working, since there is some topographic manipulation and shaping, right? Okay. That uh, there was, that you could discuss how Olmsted had identified specific features, right? In order mm -hmm. to accentuate and shape. Because mm -hmm. uh, you, the Belvedere is somewhat concentric, correct? It's not off-centered. It looks really quite conical. Mm -hmm. Or am I misreading the grading plan? So no, I think- pretty conical. So I think uh, for you to take such a departure in terms of the shape, mm -hmm. shaping, uh, mm -hmm. I think that could have been something that you had discussed. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, uh, the next thing is this. You had been very deliberate in the shaping of the landform, but yet I am not yet convinced that you have shaped these two significant spaces 
uh, one being the plaza uh, to the north, which is your one and three. Okay. And I wonder if it's because you are challenged by the complexity of the geometry mm -hmm. and that your desire to maintain that, even though I do understand that it's a path that's traveling through a shaped space, like I understand that, yeah. but it is diminished, it, you know, there are things that I find somewhat uh, confusing. And one is, is that mm -hmm. it, starts wide and then becomes narrow as it hits that, um, as it arrives at the edge of the Belvedere, which mm -hmm. I would actually have thought that that would be a place where it would widen to accept. Okay. And yeah. that I did, and I was very deliberate when I used the term parade ground, because mm -hmm. I would have assumed that you wouldn't want your parade to peter out. You, I think it ends in a way that is celebratory. And I don't, I'm unable to read in the shaping of the land how mm. the parade comes to a conclusion. Yeah. Be it either the northern part in one or in three. Mm -hmm. So even though those are marks that happen in terms of the paving, I'm curious about the spatial shaping of those important moments in these public celebrations. Okay. And Thanks. then, you know, my thought would be then, then that it becomes more, those are the flattened, well, flat shaped areas that can then be colonized informally uh, when it's barbecue time, picnic time. Right. I don't know about the car wash, but I'm okay yeah. with that. Um, but there are these plate, you know, so that's, that's my question for you. Yeah. But I think that working with the parades was inspired. I really appreciate that. I think I might miss the roundabout at the uh, terminus or at the beginning of the axis there, but mm -hmm. um, I'll let you convince me that I shouldn't miss it at all. Um, it was just really hard to find out what exactly happens when the parades come to Franklin, I I couldn't even find like a route, an image of a route anywhere. I had to like read the directions of the way they described, like take a right on Blue Hill and then take a left on Seaver. And so they just say like, we end here. And so I didn't really have a clear understanding of what exactly happens when they reach Franklin, but knowing that there's thousands of people that, um, participate in these parades, it made sense to me in my mind that it would be this continuous, uh, it would be this continuous experience and that people can spectate from multiple locations and the parade can just keep going instead of like all these floats gathering up and getting stuck in one area, they could just keep going and then the parade or the celebration would continue on the grounds. So that was my my rationale behind it. Um, yeah, I, I see your point though, Hope. I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> okay, the drawing's lovely. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I guess I had some similar questions um, uh, around, well, I guess if I had a sort of high level critique and um, it would be that you, you you took you picked one of the more difficult places on the in the park um, and one of the really critical places in the park um, which we would love to get our hands on but we can't because the zoo owns it and the golf course owns oh. it so this is like a great place to to operate and then you kind of removed all of the things that were difficult about it. You got rid of the cars, you got rid of the parking, you got rid of the uh, golf club. So I would say that maybe in another um, project, I'd love to see what you would do if you had to kind of grapple with some of the stuff that was there for um, yeah. you know, critical programmatic reasons that you aren't adjusting, like the, the zoo entrance and see mm -hmm. how your new idea and some of the things that are needed there are the relationships that are historic that Hope mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. could, um, either you, you make a clear argument for why they're being removed and in, in favor of what you're replacing it with, or you find a way to get your project to have a dialogue with 
those. And that kind of grappling is something you're going to do a lot in practice. So a good yeah. just, um, you know, to think about. I'm also having a little bit of a trouble understanding. I mean, I think the gesture of these sort of concentric ovals and the elegance of that um, interwoven path system is quite lovely. Um, I'm ha also having a hard time understanding what you've changed um, specifically in terms of the topography. And again, mm -hmm. as you recognize that place in its existing topography has like some very powerful potential, both in relationship to a kind of elevated, almost um, theatrical relationship to the Blue Hill Avenue, which is undermined by all of that car traffic and parking, yeah. and then an overlook relationship of those domed landforms um, over the meadow, which is now the um, golf course. So um, yeah. I would have liked to have maybe more clearly through like a before and after diagram or a before and after grading plan, even if it was, you know, sort of gestural, really understood um, where you were leaving the existing grades and where you were changing them and how you're making some of those um, decisions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I definitely, I did the grading plan. Um, I have a piece of paper right here on my desk. <laughs> yeah. How can I did go it. To your, maybe go to your model and we can just. It's quite, it's quite complicated, but I think I figured it out. Um, I think it's possible, but yeah, um, okay. essentially there already is this peak right here and there's a very steep slope, which leads you down to that uh, parking lot, which then turns into that trail that snakes through the park. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially I, I carved out that hill and made a more distinguishable hill out of that peak. Cause right now it's sort of like this weird plateau flat spot right there. Yep. Um, and then shaped that auditorium and cut and filled that auditorium into that hillside that's already there. I got it. Okay. But yeah, I agree. I should have probably put a before and after grading plan. That would have made a lot more sense. So, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of change. Um, yeah. And I think it, it is true that it's very unlike the, um, the character of the landforms that are out there currently, but there's something, I mean, just as a grading gesture, it's very beautiful. And I, I do like the way that um, you have this sort of um, intro plaza and then a hill and then a kind of backside plaza. So people have an opportunity to really have a um, vibrant relationship to the street and then maybe mm -hmm. a quieter gathering place that has that overlook that is very in keeping with a lot of the thinking um, in the original plan. Yeah. The part that seems the least convincing to me, I think is um, is the way the, the like um, the most urban edge um, where there's something where you've sort of, you've sort of brought the pastoral character way onto what is the mo the busiest and um, most uh, commercial street. Mm -hmm. um, and that edge, and I'm not even really talking about the bulk of the, the hey, where am I? <laughs> Can you see this thing? That uh, line. Oh, oh yeah, I see it, yep. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yay. That the that edge seems like a sort of um, critical relationship between the park and the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and I think it would have been interesting. This there's some things like this path and maybe even this um, meadow, which feel um, uh, like details that maybe are, are are not supporting a kind of stronger. A stronger yeah. vision and you, mm -hmm. you know, had an idea and you added it in and there mm -hmm. may be a missed opportunity along here to have um, a different kind of relationship with that street and that neighborhood um, so yeah. I don't, maybe I'm not understanding the project clearly, yeah but um, that's no. where I think that sort of theatrical or C and B scene or community gathering mm -hmm. um, um, issues that you're really interested in and if you have described so beautifully could have been taken on in maybe a more 
urban way. Okay, yeah. Um, that's a great point, thank you. Um, I don't know, I guess I was trying to ensure that I wanted to make sure that pedestrians felt safe in this very yeah. urban um, condition, even though it's not quite super urban yet, it's still like a very residential neighborhood, but I kind of imagined Blue Hills, oh my God, my cat, <laughs> Blue Hill transforming into this very uh, commercial corridor, bustling with lots of activity and whatnot. And so I wanted to create a sense of enclosure, um, especially in, at <laughs> especially in um, the Muriel Plaza and creating a visual connection between the commercial corridor and that plaza. So the, the thought behind it was to ensure that people felt safe and that they were enclosed and they were in a space where they felt secure. So that's very in keeping with Olmsted's original attitude about the park that you wanted yeah. to get inside and, and um, you know, not be aware of what's going on in the city, but but I think there's, it's worth thinking about whether maybe in your plaza moment, there's something important about um, inviting the city into the park and having the park come back out into the city and how that would, how that might, um, how that might really um, create a, a primary entrance to the park that was at a civic scale. Um, rather yeah. than something where you're trying to make um, something that is more pastoral or more protected because there's so much acreage where that's available already, but there isn't really an entry where, um, and, and I think your parade, to Hope's point about a parade ground, you'd need like more um, paving maybe or open space um, if people are going to park floats and everything, that you really want this to be a beautiful kind of conversation between the neighborhood, the most commercial side of that, and the park. Um, but that said, I think the the idea of how you're thinking how a project would work both for like major events that maybe happen once a year, and right. a lot of you know weekly, monthly, um, you know kind of rhythm of life events is is really strong. So I appreciate your direction on that. Thank you. Yeah, it was really challenging designing for such a flux of events. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. I was thinking a lot of um, a lot of what Kristen just said about sort of that edge adjacent to the neighborhood is sort of where my um, I am thinking went to, and that is a really difficult edge because if you look one block beyond um, Blue Hill Avenue, you know all the um, all the streets are kind of oriented away from the park, so you don't have yeah. you don't have um, except for those kind of minor commercial buildings, you don't have um, a lot of um, uses or structures that are fronting and framing it. So it's this different relationship than um, some other places or what you might usually kind of picture as um, eyes on the park or embracing the park. So I think I think it's true that it would have been good to look both at um, that band within the park and kind of think about how you, how you relate, but then also look one block beyond because um, the pattern there is really quite different. Um, yeah. And and some opportunity there too. I think that you could you could take on thinking about those connections beyond the crosswalks too, um, to how you how you bring the two sides together. Um, there were some nice things too. I think that we um, I know we don't have tons of time, but in some of the earlier framing that I just wanted to bring back also um, the meadow walk we didn't get to talk about too much, but I think that is a really kind of needed connection. Um, we've seen through um, you know observation being in the park lately, but also um, a lot of the kind of survey feedback we got uh, in the master plan that Circuit Drive is one of the kind of most used places just for walking. And I think we saw digging a little deeper that um, it's not a place that people feel like they can take children. And so the idea of yeah. sort of an alternative way to get through the park so that where you live around the park doesn't define how you use it um, as much as it maybe does today is an interesting and important idea. I think, I think there were a lot of things like that that you in the beginning in your kind of reading of the park um, were really spot on about. Um, it sounds very minor, but also the, the bathrooms, <laughs> that's that's top of the list You're as well. Like, yes. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so there's data now that exists to support that. Um, and and so addressing that, you know, really literally is important. Um, I think I think the, uh, the golf course is a real question mark in terms of, um, 
you know, how you treat that. Another thing we saw is that it's a really important place for one specific yeah. neighborhood, um, Mattapan, right. um, and for older adults who don't have kind of use in other ways. So maybe thinking about designing for that kind of community alternate places if you're kind of reducing the usability or, or thinking, thinking about new spaces. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, um, one thing that our public health can, uh, teammate has been talking about a little bit is planning. You know, we're seeing across other large park spaces in cities that that's um, that's a place that you know people are needing to use for um, temporary hospitals or things like that. Um, and so thinking oh. about this not just as a place that in you know parade time is um, is a big event space, but it's also going to have the infrastructure um, for um, major support needs like that too, city, city infrastructure. Um, so uh, you we agree. I didn't, that as sort of a third type of use. I didn't catch that. It was, you said that the public health officials are saying that they're utilizing the golf course as an, as infrastructure to. So in other parks and other cities, we're seeing oh, that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And so doing thinking that. about that as kind of another layer of, um, activities or planning that you might do since, since yeah. we're sitting within that moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with everything going on around us, I can't help but think about how much of an impact everything this situation is going to have on our parts, you know, with social distancing and, mm -hmm. you know, ensuring that people can stay a safe distance from one another and, um, you know, even funding. Uh, I mean, it's going to affect, it's going to impact parks a lot. So, yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot the past few weeks for sure. And I was just curious where what your um, your naming was for these these places. Where did where did the names come from? Um, yeah, so Grand Dom is actually uh, a nickname for Elma Lewis, and if you're aware of her, she uh, founded or was one of the co-founders of the Franklin Coalition, which is the mm -hmm. nonprofit organization, um, and she was sort of. <laughs> this role model and inspiration in the Roxbury community. And um, she founded this school of art and music and um, started that Elma Lewis Playhouse in the Park concert series in the summertime. And um, just really an amazing figure. I was very inspired by her and the work that she did. And, you know, she's very well respected in Roxbury, Mattapan and Dorchester. And I just wanted to make sure that her name was in the park somewhere besides a little pop-up structure that happens in the mm -hmm. South. Like I yeah. wanted her to have a legacy that's like ingrained in Franklin because there's, we, we give, we have to give some props to her for everything that she did. So yeah. Nice. Very cool. Glad I asked. Yeah. yeah. She, she is awesome. <laughs> She's so cool. <laughs> Thanks V for going first. I know it's always that takes a little bit yeah. longer, a little harder to get our heads into what we're doing. But, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I think that the critique was really good. I think that if the if, if we had a few more weeks together, I think it would be easy now to take what you just heard from the critics, particularly, I think, I think the thing that stands out to me is the idea of what what's appropriate, what feels right in form giving and plan versus how does it sort of respond, react to the land and the program needs. And that's something, a dialogue we've been having the whole time with your project. So mm -hmm. if you guys can imagine at one point, her project was a series of really disconnected places and trying to get to this moment, which I think is, real, as Kristen said, really lovely of three spaces that can work independently, but also can can, can dovetail and, and, and support each other for large scale events was just a really sublime little move, big move. And then I think the question about how you then dig in more deeply to those plazas to make sure that the form really comes out of that use and, um, mm -hmm. and scale and uh, material quality and relationship and adjacency in ways that's really intentional. So I have no doubt we could, we could dig in on that for the next couple of weeks and it would be really fun. Um, but I, I super appreciate, and I do appreciate too, that Hope said the drawings are lovely, the across the board, the presentation was very clear, very beautiful. And so thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Gina. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Hope, Kristen, and Bree. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, V. <laughs> beautiful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. You're all ready? Yes.
All right. Can you see it? Okay. Awesome. So my uh, project is called Beauty and the Bus. So this makes sense because resilience and mobility go hand in hand. And Boston has a goal for 2030 to increase public transit and walking in the city and decrease driving alone, which um, spatially on our streets make a lot of sense to put more people on a bus. Um, they'll look differently after COVID, of course, and, um, but they'll still be needed. And it also makes sense as the population rises. Um, so as you guys know, um, Franklin Park is in this really unique position, kind of bracketed between these two metro lines that move south into the city and really provide access for only the Jamaica Plain neighborhood. The rest of the neighborhoods surrounding Franklin um, do not have direct access to the metro and therefore rely heavily on the bus system. And um, the survey data from who's riding the bus says that those people in those neighborhoods are mostly African-American, mostly women, and they ride the bus about five days a week. It's pretty often. Um, you'll also notice that this web of bus system kind of creates this, um, this area of transit between the two metro lines. And there are 13 bus routes that directly engage with Franklin Park and an additional 20 bus routes that intersect at the Forest Hills kind of bus hub um, to the west. And the pink lines on this um, map also show the most congested streets in Boston with more than 2,500 passengers a day. And you'll notice that one of them goes directly through on Circuit Drive through um, Franklin. So I saw this lovely opportunity to create a symbiotic relationship between the park and the bus, and this is a direct kind of beneficial relationship. So the, the bus brings people to the park, kind of activates the park in all these different ways, creates accessibility in the park, and the park directly benefits transit by creating um, identity and destination, among other things. And of course, you can't think about the bus system without thinking about the pedestrian experience. So um, because, well, because 96% of Bostonians get to their bus stops, get to and from their bus stops on foot. Um, and so therefore kind of the pedestrian experience is a transit experience. And so I started the semester by breaking the park into these three different major zones, what I call park light, which is um, just the edge of the park. And this is a zone where you may be just riding the bus and not even kind of look at the park. Then there's dip your toes. So this zone where you're, you're riding the bus, but you get pulled in just slightly into the park. And then finally, um, plot committed. So you're going to the park because you want to and you're an aware user. Um, and I really took inspiration from that to turn more people that are unaware users into aware users. And the project really circulates around one kind of broad, swift move, um, which is to turn Circuit Drive from this three-lane, um, really large bisecting route through the park into bus-only lanes. Therefore, continuing to provide access, but really creating a pedestrian-centric zone um, and really streetscape zone throughout the park. I also noticed a lot of opportunity to the west of the park. Um, there is parcels that connect Franklin to the rest of the Emerald Necklace that, is, that are owned by the Mass Transit Authority. So again, another opportunity for this symbiosis between the park and the bus. And then this zone in blue throughout the park is the zone that I um, identified as like an opportunity zone to get people engaged with the park that maybe wouldn't normally. You can also see in this diagram, the bus route going through, the bike route, and then in black, the pedestrian route. So this all culminated in this really kind of surgical moves along the bus route and um, in this framework plan. And essentially, not it was designing both edges of the park, so the western edge and the eastern edge, but really focusing on um, vegetation edits, pulling kind of the curtain back at the moments of the bus stops to provide these gorgeous views um, and get people engaged with the park, even if they don't get off the bus. Um, I also thought about the, the commute through the park 
um, with a median treatment and a non-median treatment. So in the pink line, you'll see that there's a median present. And therefore, you can imagine that your, your um, commute to and from work would be different, looking at different things each way. And then in the purple zones in the park, there is no median. This is where I imagine the road being narrowed and there being a united experience. So for example, where the buses go between the drum wounds to create this kind of intimate um, geological experience. So I'm going to take you really quick on a commute through the park, um, this kind of cinematic approach to design for the person on the bus. Um, starting at this parcel to the west, so this is the emerald necklace connection that is currently just parking lots for the bus. Um, but because of this symbiosis, the parking lot still exists, but it is buffered by this park extension, um, creating a pedestrian safe zone there as well. Then moving into the park, it's now winter, you're also going to be moving through the seasons, because um, that's important to think year round. Um, you see that the uh, there is a priority given to the bus, not only through the pavement choices, but also through vegetation edits in the median, um, kind of emphasizing the bus only lanes. Then going around the corner, this is where the drumlins kind of come up close to the, um, the edges of the roads. And with vegetation edits, you would be able to experience, and road narrowing, you would be able to experience kind of a more intimate view of that geology. But what happens when you get off the bus? So I started to imagine now that you're in the center of the park, um, the body experience of being enclosed and framed in this bus. And then what, what would make you want to get off the bus um, as a receiving space in the park? So creating bus stops as social hubs, creating ceiling with trees, but also wide expansive views out um, as this mediation between the enclosed and framed and this extroverted park space. So this central hub is broken down um, and really concentrated around the bus routes. So you'll see that there's benches kind of sculpturally moving through the park to not only provide a functional kind of seating space for park or for the bus, um, but also to start to engage someone that's maybe waiting for the bus and pull them into the park just slightly. Um, You'll also see kind of a successional show forest. I, I too, just like V, um, edited the golf course. And so I thought that there was a lot more potential to make it a public um, space instead of a private golf course in this large park. And then um, there's, there's also overlooks um, and seating with the push and pull of the land, really sculptural grading um, to pull you out in different views. So this bench that moves through to the east um, not only holds back this kind of restoration meadow, but also creates an edge that stretches into the park, creating a kind of a comfort zone um, to make someone or to encourage someone that wouldn't maybe usually use the park to move into it. There's convex spaces for solitude in our COVID time and concave spaces for, um, for more social Kind of gathering. So really something for every bus user. And then looking east, you can see that the all of this kind of design concentration is pretty close to the bus. Um, and you can also see that the, the median in the bus zone um, really creates this pedestrian friendly zone um, that moves into the larger scale. This is what um, the bus stop in the middle of the park currently looks like. So you're looking out into the golf course. You can see a lot of potential here. There's not um, really any formal pedestrian access here. And the current bus receiving area is um, kind of leads something, leaves something to be desired. So I imagine this space um, using the same um, topography as the golf course um, and kind of emphasizing it a little bit more to create this sculptural bench, um, this kind of activated social hub by the bus stop um, that gets people excited about the park. And this cove-like space over here for more kind of formalized seating before you move into the greater park. 
Um, just west of that spot, you also look, looking south again, um, into this beautiful view of the private golf course. Again, not a lot of seating. This is um, along the bus route. And I imagine this space really becoming um, not only a successional show for us, as I mentioned, this kind of restoration of this part of the golf course, but also um, activating this zone as, as a social hub um, around the bus. This is looking at Circuit Drive. This is one of the major changes that I made. Um, so it's now super wide. There's a lot of parking lots that aren't used often, they're locked, um, and a lot of potential here. So I imagine this space becoming a pedestrian-centric zone with not only that median, but all of that seating moving through. So really the same theme running all the way throughout. This is looking at that same, um, that same kind of northern foyer, is what, is what I want to call it, um, which provides this resting space and this mediating space before getting into the larger park. And then, of course, I was thinking about the median experience too, because this is where the bus experience and the pedestrian experience come together. So I was thinking about the height of vegetation in the median, kind of starting low, where there's mostly just kind of bus movement, and then raising up as a visual um, clue of arrival, but also of arrival at the bus stops, but also looking at um, different bark treatment and different species that I could use for seasonal interest throughout your bus window. Getting back on the bus um, and riding east into the park, you'll see that meadow that was created by that sculptural bench um, and, and the walkway adjacent. And then arriving to the east, um, really all of these moments that are freed by making the circuit drive bus only. This used to be a parking lot um, and now becomes this gradiential formalized plaza that moves through old and new groves. This is um, a look at the existing conditions of that same plaza looking in from Blue Hill Avenue. Um, and the movement or the design move of simply removing um, the cars from Circuit Drive allow the ability to create all of these accessible pedestrian centric zones um, on the edges and within. This, um, this was what I imagined Blue Hill Avenue would look like from above, from plan view. So that white is just that mediating um, plaza moving into the park. And then I also saw the bus system and park system symbiosis um, as a system that extends far beyond Franklin borders to connect the rest of the Emerald Necklace by just simply um, giving the bus priority and, um, and creating pedestrian centric zones around all the stops. So that's Beauty in the Bus, the symbiosis between the park system and the bus system. Should we clap? <laughs> we can clap. <laughs> I don't know how to do that icon. Um, it's on the bottom. Uh, it's the one thing I can do. Maybe again, we could go back to a view that is sort of about the whole project. Um, sure. Um, I'll go to um, the central node. I guess I, I mean, I was a little surprised where the project ended up. And this is one of those comments where you, you know, you wonder why the critic is talking about what you didn't do instead of what you did do. But um, I thought the observation about, um, you know, the eastern side of the park not really um, be, you know, having to rely on bus movement um, 
for their transportation around the city and that um, buses could be critical ways of bringing visitor, you know, increased visitorship to the park. Um, and the real significant problem of this kind of scar or divide, further divide, that um, allowing a lot of high speed, very wide, um, cut through traffic on Circuit Drive um, creates for that sense of like being in park in a coherent way is really, really good observations. Um, I kind of thought that you were going to spend um, you were going to make a linear park within a park um, and that there was going to be a little bit more because I think your observation that you know mobility is resilience and um, that you were going to be deeper into um, circuit drive as the park rather than than having these other um, spill outs that became deep park interventions I sort of had imagined um, that that maybe um, we could come back to this one. Could you go to one of the early sections where you, um, yeah, or uh, yeah, maybe there was one oh, where you sorry. show the trees. Um, I think it was earlier and you had a kind of sense of the tree, yeah, these guys. So that maybe that, that this section where you start to talk about how there's a, there's a linear park and it's for pedestrians and bikes and you may add more trees on the side and then you, you advocate for a tree median, that this would be kind of the project and the park, um, the park would happen, the new park would happen, here's my draw, the new park would happen in that thickening that you are mm -hmm. engaging and allowing for by making that um, shrinking the domain of the car. Um, and I think that to the extent that that was engaged in the project, it's it's really great. I don't know if I buy the median thing. Medians are like super tough places for plants to grow. Um, yeah. And um, I could just see that becoming one big dead plant line over time. But there, you know, the, the opportunity of, of um, limiting the asphalt, vehicular asphalt and smushing those buses even closer mm -hmm. together to gain ground on the side where maybe you're allowing for um, like car, uh, you know, you have your bus, then you have your bikes, then you have your pedestrians and maybe there's more trees here and maybe there's another pedestrian or a bike route that allows you know, a very dendritic sort of um, park that is happening within this park that is more mm -hmm. about the fragments that remain after we've given away so much territory to specific program ownership. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a missed potential in like sticking to your guns on um, an interest in the territory of the bus. And I could see that all, even these sort of convex and concave benches and um, grading that you seem to be sort of interested in spatially and how that relates to the sort of rolling of the meadow, which could be quite beautiful. It could be more integrated as one park that starts to just kind of um, maybe with less complexity, but more um, like strong attitude about planting and paving and seeding, maybe just those things but it would be like one organism that um, where you hit that that kind of valley gates area really pulls out and becomes stretch and um, you know like a sp I'm not I'm making a hand gesture because I can't you know, talk anymore but like that that thing that's linear starts to really become serpentine and that's how you get your space and then it kind of goes back and obey mm. a more linear route so there's a way in which the project is like two projects and I think it could be one much stronger project if um, you had kind of stuck to that initial inspiration of the circuit drive and buses. But there's a lot of really interesting and great work here. That's super helpful, thank you. I appreciated, um, you know, that you started with such a clear focus. Um, and I think there was a lot to kind of how you took us 
through that was also very clear, kind of marching through the geography as an experience of, of being on this bus. Um, I think that there's some context, um, especially to kind of transit in Boston that could be helpful too, to maybe broaden the impact of your project. Um, you know, there's, Boston has um, a subway system that exists on kind of a hub and spoke um, arrangement. You probably wrote it when you were out here and it, it's tied to a, a history of, um, you know, of inequity and not bringing service to certain areas of the um, city, which meant to certain populations. And so I think we see today that you know, if you if you kind of looked at Franklin and access to Franklin in relationship to other parts of the city, it's really disconnected. And so, the bus in many ways is both an essential service, but also not doing nearly enough, you know, to bring access to this community. And so, I think um, I think maybe just looking at that would help kind of frame the equity discussion too a little bit more around um, how this project knits into the rest of the city and maybe help you make the case for more investment around transit services here. And I think like Kristen was saying that um, I, at one point when you were going through, it made me think that it's kind of, um, it's this, the project wants to be more about, as she was saying, kind of circuit drive and less about the bus because you probably need to rely on a lot more layers of, of transportation and, um, and connectivity to start to make up for some of the um, access challenges that the, that the community has. So I think, I think kind of zooming out and bringing the equity story in much more directly would be helpful. Um, and then that might also point to, um, you know, some of the related to that, we know that this is an area that has a lot of um, challenges around air quality. And so I think there were some, some decisions around, um, and maybe this isn't literally how you would, how you meant it, but you talked about kind of, um, opening up areas around the bus stops. And it just made me think those are the areas that actually need um, need shelter more, need trees more, need vegetation, um, because there you've got people kind of lingering in um, mm -hmm. in spaces that have, you know, a lot more um, vehicular pollution and all of that. And so there was some kind of counterintuitive pieces there that made me think maybe if there's a little bit more data um, and context, um, it might have sent you sent to you in a little bit different route with some of that. Um, I do think there's a lot that could be done with circuit drive too. And I wonder if, um, you know, you thought about the kind of essential service that the, that the bus serves and then what other services you could kind of string along there that would, that would hit on some of those equity questions too, um, like Wi-Fi or, you know, maybe this is sort of like a technology spine, um, bathrooms we heard about and hopefully we'll hear more <laughs> in other projects too about how those are needed but thinking of this as sort of like a, a service spine where you could cluster not just landscape experiences but also critical amenities um, that people need um, both to enjoy the park um, but also um, also that maybe aren't being met um, in in their neighborhoods um, so that that was I think I think that's a place that you could kind of um, uh, take the project and kind of amp up the impact of it. Um, trying to think other comments. Oh, you know, I think another, um, as you were sort of walking us through the experience of going from node to node to node to node to node to node, to node um, yeah. it made me wonder like, how many do we need? And is there a logic for um, the location of them that is also not just about maybe picking special places, which is maybe what you were doing, but also mm -hmm. um, like, connectivity and distance between and sort of just use some of the operational patterns overlaid on top. Yeah, that's super helpful. I can segue off of that. Forgive me, I no longer remember if there are any pedestrian path, any pedestrian crossings on circuit, on the circuit drive, which, you know, I started to think about the medium, the median and the fact that, you know, thank you, Alex Krieger, Right, it's this wonderful place. It's a safety. Uh, it's a you know, it's a it's a moment and a pause in safety in terms of crossings. So, I was looking for some relationship between the location of the medians and a pedestrian crossing or potential pedestrian crossing, so that it they ended up serving a dual a dual purpose. Um, and so, you know, that was something that I, my memory I I don't have it anymore. Uh, and 
So my, uh, my apologies. So I, I couldn't make the correspondence uh, between them. Um, there is one thing, and I believe that uh, Kristen and Bree both brought this up. And I found the concave and the convex uh, spaces intriguing. But what I was unclear about is the distance between the pedestrian way or the right of way of the road, the curb, the sidewalk, and then the location of these benches. And so as Bree started uh, discussing about protection, whether other services, they didn't appear to me, they were at these points that were pushing into the park, but yet they didn't have a spatial definition that, or, or a proximity, like a study of proximity uh, in terms of how deep are you going to go if you're a dip your toes uh, in term, and then and getting to the bus. You know, what, what is that, that dimension, that space within which you are working? Right, and then what is then, and you call the, th the foyer, but yet the foyers to me, they, again, they were these Vs or these, you know, pushes into the park, but they didn't appear always spatial. So that there was this mark of a threshold, which then got me worried about how you were changing the golf course. I don't, can you, not that you were, but, how much were you taking away and how much were you putting the pedestrian into these gray areas within the golf course itself? Can you occupy the rough, right? Or into the woods? Like there is a, there is a clear, you know, um, and I don't have all the golf vocabulary, excuse me, but uh, I think there's a, there's a way in which you probably could find these gradients where there can be an overlap, but you have to be super judicious, which means that you weren't, how much were you taking away as opposed yeah. to taking it, you know, polite, you know, borrowing, sharing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, cause then, right. Cause you know, we know there's always, you know, a stray golf ball or, you know, uh, when the, you know the 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 overlaps of uses right safety issues too but i i wonder if there's a way in which you build those those boundaries that begin to allow you to take over a little bit of these um not so active parts of the golf course that still lets you have the spatial experience and the volume making that i am encouraging you to do but i think it's ambitious I enjoyed the prospect of the bus only. Uh, and I think there are just these little fine tunings, right, in relationship to all your critics' comments so far about that. Yeah, you know, um, Adrian, uh, I, I thought it was kind of remarkable. It's always remarkable to me when you have really great critics, how they like laser in on something we've been sort of touching on lightly, which is this like, how much do you solve the whole, try to solve with design the whole problem and how much do you pick places to, and, and this idea too, I think that's so critical for your project of like, what's the in-between? And I love Kristen's idea that the in-between is actually the project, you know, it's like the, just the idea of working out those circulation systems as a linear system that is giving and, and, and generous to users. Uh, and it's not just all about the sh sort of showboat pieces that are the bus stops, right? And I think um, a really beautiful way to think about your project. And I think too, the, the idea of layering in, as Bree said, these other systems, uh, you know, it's got me thinking about bathrooms and shade and rain protection and sort of all these things that, um, that could be layered into this. And so um, thank you for as always, a really beautiful story that you told us about this place. And uh, it's very vivid. It always is with you. And we really appreciate it. And um, yeah, thanks. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can do our clapping. <laughs> now I don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> it just goes away. <laughs> Kelsey, are you ready for us? Um, yeah, I can't seem to share my screen oh, though. Okay, let's try to fix that. 
Uh, I'm surprised that there aren't a wider range of reactions. I would have some other ones. <laughs> like stinker, <laughs> the poop emoji. <laughs> <laughs> oh well does it work cool. now kelsey um no i just see leave meeting as an option <laughs> which i would like to present <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know if since i'm joined that i need to be made like a co-host I just did that. So yep, you are. To see here. If anyone has other clever ideas, oh man. Hmm. Um. Well. Oh, wait, here we go. Ha ha ha. I figured it out. I oh, found great. it. The button moved. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Thank you. I was thinking of this as a Google hang. And so I was looking for okay. that and then it's literally right there. Okay, great. Idiot. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yes. No, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Okay. So my name is Kelsey, um, and this is my framework and design proposal for Franklin Park, titled A Breath of Fresh Air. So I was given the lens of ecology, and I chose to situate that in the realm of public health. So Olmsted's uh, original design for the Emerald Necklace was focused on alleviating uh, existing health issues for the Boston community at the time by harnessing the natural water systems of the Boston area. And so when we look at Franklin today, while it doesn't have these really strong water ecologies that the rest of the Emerald Necklace has, we can see in this map that it is a large space with high tree canopy cover within this urban, um, this encroaching urban core, um, which makes it a really important player in the overall air quality of the city of Boston. And so looking at the health uh, statistics for the Boston area, um, most if not all of them can be linked to a lack of time spent outdoors being active but none more so than asthma. So for Boston, um, the areas with high rates of asthma are directly correlated to areas with a high rate of mold violations. Um, and so what we're seeing is that these diseases are being experienced at three to four times the rate uh, for minorities than they are for their white counterparts. And so Franklin Park itself actually sits within several neighborhoods that have really high minority populations, which makes it a really, um, a really important site for this kind of intervention. And so one of the reasons why people aren't getting outdoors as much is because of climate, specifically wind, which can create an uncomfortable user experience, whether that be super cold winter winds like we experienced in February, or these hotter um, heat island areas within the city that are not only hotter in temperature, but they are also areas of higher pollutant concentrations. And so as we know, air doesn't just exist at Franklin Park, it exists everywhere. And so I wanted to understand how Franklin could serve as a core for this new system, but then reach out into the city um, and incorporate the design that way. And so I took a look at three different untapped connections. The first being the multimodal streets. So gaining a better understanding of where bike lanes exist or don't exist in relation to the entrances of Franklin Park. I looked at the open space network, um, to getting a better understanding of what open space is actually accessible by the public highlighting strong ecological connections between these open spaces in the solid arrows. And then the dashed arrows are opportunity moments within this urban area. 
And then I also looked at the schools surrounding Franklin Park with the understanding that when you educate children at a younger age, um, they about these types of life decisions, they make better choices as they get older in regards to their health. And so that brings us to the framework drawing, which has three parts. The core is Franklin, which is then bookended by two eco corridors. These three parts all exist along a scale um, from nature to urban with the intent that all three would incorporate elements from both to highlight this new type of symbiosis. And so I took a look at the seasonal wind corridor characteristics within the park to gain an understanding of the relationship between the direction of these seasonal winds as they relate to the protected and unprotected rooms within the park, highlighting the rooms that have program that would be desirable to keep. And so this culminates in this prevailing wind drawing. And so this drawing is highlighting those three seasonal winds, looking at the relationship between the main corridors of those seasonal winds and their relationship to the two eco corridors and the two new proposed nodes, which are highlighted here by the dash circle. And so I chose to focus on the southern node um, because it is currently the maintenance yard, so it is unused by the public. So um, as it exists now, the wind direct, main wind directions, the winter winds are coming from that northwest direction. The rest of the time it's generally coming from the west. And then in the summer, we're having that south-southeast direction. The vegetation of the site, there is a relatively thick uh, forest that borders and encircles the maintenance yard made up of oak, pine, and hickory trees. The um, small Scarborough Pond, which suffers from high pollutants from the runoff of the golf course, which is also encroaching on this natural meadow space. And then again, wanting to highlight that this site is not accessible by the public because it is a maintenance yard. So it's really cutting off those southeastern neighborhoods from having direct access, which includes a high school that sits just on the border of this park. So the design proposal has three main types of design interventions. The first focuses on maximizing filtration. Um, so using topography and vegetation buffers to inhibit um, pollutants and particulates, um, trying to hinder their level from reaching into the park and also within these new eco corridors. The second focuses on disruption and direction of wind. So again, using topography and vegetation to hinder undesirable wind, but encourage desired wind into the park. And the third focuses on encouraging air mixing. So using topography and enhancement of existing ecological features to not only maximize the cooling qualities of the air, but this also aids in the filtration processes. And so the first move is to take the maintenance yard and transition it up into what is now the hospital space. And this hospital space is already slated to be moved. So this prevents a wonderful opportunity to open up this Southern node to really embrace the existing communities here. And so it starts with a plaza that then morphs into a sinuous path, which winds up and over this ridge into this new meadow and enlarged Scarborough Pond Park core area. Um, and it moves from a more uh, active user experience to passive as you enter the core of the park. And so along this path, there are different rooms um, that have been created to provide multiple destinations to really encourage users to be pulled through this site, um, serving and uh, providing them with the, their needs for outdoor space um, for both local and regional users. And so as we zoom in on these different rooms, the first is this plaza. And the plaza, like the overall plan, is moving from more active um, user experience to passive. So there is a um, boulder splash pad at its entrance 
which then pulls users through this flexible use space into this red oak canopy grove before releasing them out into the main lawn area. The vegetational buffer along the edge has been reinforced with boulders, which double as seating. And these work to protect against those cold northwest winds from entering this area, but they're also working to remove particulates and pollutants from the air. And then because we are creating an area that is capturing a large amount of particulates, we really want to ensure that we're not having high pollution runoff from the site. So there is an underground water storage system that captures site runoff to clean and repurpose it for the use of the site. The terraced natural playscape comes off of the main path, terracing down to the main lawn area. And the materials were chosen for their textural quality as well as their durability. Um, and they encourage play and exploration for multiple generations, not just children. And the topography and canopy here are working to move that air in and around design activities to lessen the intensity of it, to really encourage that year round usage. And then the flex use workout space um, is nestled within the curvilinear um, switchback of the main path. And here you have uh, turfed terraces that wind from the path in becoming stairs before rewidening to become uh, benches and then transition into this meadow hillside. Um, the core lawn and DG area um, provide space for larger gatherings, whether they be specifically for workout groups or just general everyday use. And then the terraces are lined by a smooth precast concrete seating, um, which expands at different areas to um, allow for more easy ADA access. And they are, have rounded edges, which then curve down to meet grade to provide proper lumbar support for users. And this circular um, design really works to direct air in a circular motion, winding up and through the tree canopy to prevent any sort of stagnant air from collecting here. And so in these eco corridor sections, we're seeing these same design strategies implemented for maximizing a filtration. We're really working on adding or enhancing the existing vegetational buffers to really work to contain those particulates and pollutants within the vehicular corridor, rather than allowing them to escape into the cyclist and pedestrian realms. We're disrupting and directing airflow. Boston, like many cities with tall buildings, suffers from wind tunnels. And so by adding these new vegetational features, they create new objects that the wind is forced to move in and around of, lessening that wind tunnel effect. And then of course, dealing with this issue of heat island, when wind is not directly flowing down a street, it's flowing over top of the buildings, not being able to reach down at the pedestrian level where this heat is gathering. So by introducing these new vegetational pieces that can now pull the air down, encouraging mixing as it flows through and cooling the site itself. And then in perspective, we start to see the seasonal qualities of this design. So in the fall, we're really working to encourage that cool Western breeze to blow through breaks in the vegetational buffer while still hindering that the beginnings of that chilly winter wind from blowing directly in. And this creates an improved site comfortability, which provides renewed access for these neighborhoods. In winter, the uh, vegetation and topography are again working in tandem to prevent that cold winter wind from blowing directly into the park, providing a space of refuge, which allows um, and encourages users to come here in the winter, which is usually time that they would have spent indoors. In the spring, that air is blowing into the park, cooling as it flows over this new expanded lake area, 
providing a really wonderful microclimate that encourages users just to sit and relax and really restore their mental tranquility. And then in summer, again, encouraging that summer breeze to flow in, up, and over into the core of the park, providing a much needed break from that summer heat, which in turn will lessen the level of air pollutants and provide a revived healthy lungs. And with that, I welcome any comments or questions. Kelsey, what's, what was the literature you used to help sort of set this up? Yeah, so I did a lot of research um, and um, as I had talked about earlier, I wasn't able to um, fully model this, but I was able to read papers um, that where people were able to model it. And so a lot of the information that I was looking at was previous studies um, and implemented projects that looked at sort of like the width of vegetational buffers, the height, what, what's working, what doesn't work, um, you know, what's the optimal size um, and so that sort of, that was what I was mainly looking at. Um, and of course there are, you know, many studies that are done, Boston especially um, has several recently that were done looking at the air quality, looking at the climate and how that's adjusting. Um, so I was, you know, sort of pulling from multiple sources um, and trying to apply that information to the site, working with the restrictions, both topographically and then street width as well. Okay. So would you characterize when you needed to increase air? So I know there's a thickening in the use of vegetation, mm -hmm. but how much grading, how much is grading playing a part in this in terms of quantity of change? Yeah, absolutely. So in the street sections, um, I, I didn't really touch that other than, you know, adjusting um, the certain uh, widths of items and adding new things within the Park, um, I worked with the natural topography and just adjusted it to fit these new landforms so they are situated within it. So it does go naturally from lowest point at the plaza up the ridge line. Mm -hmm. um, and so the main grading changes are to allow for that path and those different rooms to expand out from it. Um, but topography does play a big role because it is terraced as you're moving up. So it was definitely important in um, increasing those heights and determining which areas would work for flatter spaces and which areas would, would need more terraces to exist. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I feel very unqualified to comment on the uh, the landscape for um, you know in context of wind and air quality and all of that. But I think um, you know I was glad glad to see the kind of framing of your project around public health and air quality and kind of starting from starting from the issues and the needs. I think mm -hmm. that's a really good way to get to um, get to problems. I think you know the we we do know that um, you know that the, um, the air quality issue is one. I think that you mentioned mold at, at some point, and I think mm -hmm. that's gonna be much more related to the age of the buildings around, mm -hmm. um, around the park and more kind of the right. residential structures where people live. So less something that you can really impact here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and more, we're here we're probably more talking about kind of vehicular, um, you know, uh, pollution and, and those elements. So I think, mm -hmm. I think the question I would have is, like, is there a way to make the impact of a site scale project like this kind of mm -hmm. bigger? Um, because I think the scale of the problem is really big and it's not yeah. solvable at a site scale, you no. know? So <laughs> if you could think about, you mentioned at one point, um, I, I think kind of the um, youth angle and education and the importance of that. And I think I would have liked to see a little bit more playing up of that. And if you could talk mm -hmm. about kind of impact impact that you could make to a bigger system through some programmatic ideas. Maybe mm -hmm. there's just more, um, you emphasize fitness, but I think there's a lot of room for 
more educational components too that would that would tie to that piece. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, and maybe maybe you had that. Um, no, absolutely. I was just um, gonna say to your point. Um, I should have emphasized this more. My my comment on the mold um, mm -hmm. is I know I um, it, it is highlighted that it is from the from the buildings themselves. And so my intent in highlighting that was to uh, to demonstrate that these open spaces become even more important and that by making them more inviting, it encourages people to spend less time indoors where the mold is present and more time mm -hmm. outside in that fresher air. Um, but absolutely to your point about um, sort of the youth angle, the education system, um, I did and should have, you know, I Sorry, I didn't get time to label my plan, um, but um, I did work to add a smaller plaza here directly across from this high school. So okay. that becomes a space for students to use before, after school, but also is a lead in to the park entrance. Um, and that I was seeing that while I am highlighting exercise that since that tends to be one of the main um, uses of the park at present. Um, mm -hmm. These spaces could become places where people could come to observe natural processes and learn about them within the park. Um, I, I absolutely see those spaces becoming that, um, whether it's being at the plaza and, you know, understanding how the boulders work together and the, the different um, pieces of that make up the geology of the boulder, but then also, you know, coming into the meadow, walking over the lake um, and, you know, understanding that process as well. I definitely see these as they could um, transition or be used in that way as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think this, this drawing also made me think that at the beginning, I thought it was an interesting kind of selection. I liked your, fr your framework with the two kind of roots and then this, the park at the center um, and an interesting selection of this site. You didn't mention the um, the cemetery, and that's something I kind of have always had in the back of my mind too. The adjacency yeah. to the cemetery, and that's going to be this kind of, you know, why this is a, at the center of a big area of tree cover. Um, but I think that's another interesting thing to possibly engage. I think that would be my big message that I think, okay. you know, this problem just wants to engage kind of bigger. How does how do people take home what they experience here? Um, that it's more than just an escape. It also absolutely you know, kind of leads out. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm but really, really interesting problem to raise and try to tackle at a, um, at a site scale. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I could maybe tag onto that because I think one of the things that I'd wanna talk about is how you make decisions about where you cite your work mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on analysis. And I was surprised that you landed here based on the sort of depth and breadth of um, some of your early diagramming because mm -hmm. although the maintenance yard does create problems for the deepest kind of south point um that side actually has pretty good um ways in they're not so blocked by rock walls or the the overgrowth um the um, vegetation is less um so visually and actually physically maybe not what where the maintenance yard is but that um um, that side of the park actually has pretty, there's good momentum between mm -hmm. um, the neighborhood and the park. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think very interesting idea to move the maintenance yard to the Shattuck site, but mm -hmm. a little problematic when your project is about public health in part, because that site is, is, um, serves like, uh, you know, homeless addicts and um, prison populations and really people who um, don't have anywhere else to go. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be ready to defend um, that decision uh, relative to your thesis, I think. Mm -hmm. um, can we go back to, um, can we go back to maybe one of your bigger plans? Um, sorry, your early diagrams where you're doing the wind um, studies. Uh, uh, like, like this? Yeah. Okay. So I think to Bree's point, and I think, you know, some of this is, um, the challenge in a short semester that is trying to get you down to the scale of a body, which is small, um, getting, you know, the, the kind of full whammo out of the project idea. So I, I appreciate that you all have to pick a site and dig in deep to, to think about how a person operates. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But what I really thought was interesting, very interesting about these diagrams, I think to Bree's point is that maybe it's not one place that solves this because maybe there's winter yeah. places and summer places and fall mm -hmm. places. And mm -hmm. what you're used doing in your analysis is kind of identifying where are people gonna feel most protected in the winter? And that takes advantage of the drumlin forms and the rock walls and evergreen vegetation and you know, orientation of topography mm -hmm. versus where do they want to be in the summer, which does the, you know, same minus the evergreen vegetation, you know, mm -hmm. is maybe more open, invites mm -hmm. these winds in. And so I think there is an opportunity to take a lot of the ideas that you got into really fine grain on at the maintenance mm -hmm. yard and think about how, again, um, maybe you have to design less and site more. Um, okay. So, mm -hmm. um, you kind of, you, you use this incredible analysis about how um, the big scale wind is working and I could have really, used, the drawings are incredibly beautiful, um, but not being a kind of wind dynamic scientist, mm -hmm. I had to believe that the wind that you sort of drew as fairy dust was doing what it was really doing. And so I think having just in this way that this feels very like kind of dumb, but clear and mm -hmm. um, believable, having just little vignettes about really how wind moves around okay. the tree and then down into a space and it either gets blocked or redirected. Okay. And showing your more illustrative work would have made me feel more confident that what you said your work was doing was really doing that. Okay, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I think, you know, t if you if you could have taken, you know, your ideas about what do people want to do in winter and therefore where would your winter projects be? What do people want to do in summer? Therefore, where will your summer projects be? And then you okay. would have a system of um, programs and mm -hmm. bench systems and how you engage topography. Mm -hmm. And you could be almost, you know, really strategic and kind of very dramatic in the way that you are interfering with the historic framework mm -hmm. um, and it would all be tied to giving um you know comfort and um and improving and tying to public health concerns um which would be a fantastic project so it's all yeah. all there it's kind of now taking that maintenance site and exploding it back out into the larger park using this analysis and kind of I'm thinking a little bit harder about where your project lives in the existing um, park. Absolutely, that that's wonderful. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Okay. Well, I completely concur. That's where I was going when I asked you about your your source material. Uh -huh. You know, and of course, you can't help but think about Ann Spurn in the Granite Garden and her discussion of uh, the choice of plant material in terms of what pollutants stick to which which types right. of species, <laughs> you know, which then right brings this into this cycle of, of uh, the temporal cycle, seasonal cycle, maintenance, you know, and of course, you know, I was thinking about the evaporative cooling effects. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm in complete agreement with Kristen and Bree in very much the way that there's a whole new way in which people will occupy this park based upon seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, what's interesting is that, um, I might take a little bit of a, a, a different position is that I think there are times when it's straight, it's, there are times when it's essential when you read the landscape, right? That you can see what it's doing. But what I appreciated about this is that all of it was so very, was relying on the senses and how people read the place as opposed to um, being so didactic in a way. Cause don't we, Speaking of my Texas experience, right? I chart my path based upon shade. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there will be this subtle rereading of the place uh, based upon um, when it's favorable to be there. So you're not just thinking about plants for interest, but it starts to expand it, that there is this time when you're looking to be exposed or you're looking to be sheltered, you're looking where there is a block, where there is a hedge, there's a whole nother complex reading of the planted landscape, which I find really intriguing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, Part absolutely. I think if anything, like we've heard in the previous two, it's, you know, more time would it would be great because there's, there's all these other layers, whether it's zooming out a little bit more or 
zooming into sort of like minute details. It, it just, you know, it would be nice to have more time to continue to implement all these really wonderful suggestions. And, you know, I think it's interesting, Kelsey, because as your critics were describing these other th ways of thinking about your investigation, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember when Kelsey made that drawing. I remember when we made when we were looking at the what's the summer route and the winter route um, through the park. And, um, you know, I think sometimes it's just uh, exactly what Kristen said, trying to get so hard into a body scale from a big kind of framework exploration makes you make choices that if you had more time and space, I know we could have done uh, more, but I think it's also really nice to think sometimes design doesn't have to solve everything mm -hmm. in one place. Sometimes it's stronger if you just say, this is my summer, summer breeze terrace, mm -hmm. and there's a, you know, winter, sheltered winter fitness cove over here. And so, um, and that that could have been a, another way of thinking about the the framework, yeah. but I promise you that it's nice. You've been so prolific this semester. We've, we've seen those drawings. We've talked about those drawings. So it's much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I just want to say the drawings are spectacularly lovely. So thank you. The, oh, thank the, the you. way you compose some of your pages, Kelsey, with so many different ways of looking at a problem, plan section, detailed section, um, really, really spectacular. Thank you. Great. Yeah. I, I didn't sleep a lot, so I'm glad <laughs> I can they tell. were good. I can, I can, I can kind of tell. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kelsey. Yay, Kelsey. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, Very Catherine. Good job, Catherine. <laughs> hey. Okay. I am going to share that. Um, okay, y'all can see? Yes? Yes, great. Okay, cool. So, my project is focusing on um, creating a trail, a main prominent trail through uh, Franklin Park. Um, but first, I started with, of course, doing a precedent study and through the lens of topography. Um, Shelby Farms Park in Memphis, Tennessee was the location and just kind of drumming it all down to there were four prominent challenges in that park, a uh, poor identity segmented infrastructure, um, fragmented ecosystems, and deficient connectivity. And then through, once we actually started getting into Franklin Park analysis, how did those apply to Franklin Park? And in many ways, um, Franklin Park has a poor identity. Plenty of people actually didn't know that it was there. They knew the zoo, but not the actual park. Um, and then the, infra the segmented infrastructure, you have, of course, the zoo up here, and then the golf course, and then the woodlands, and there was definitely like a sense that, um, that they didn't really work together in a lot of ways. And then the fragmented ecosystems, I actually saw this more as the, you know, looking more at the canopy and how dense the canopy was in many areas to the point where you couldn't you could barely even see. Of course, you could see along the actual pathways, but not much further than around the curve. And then the deficient connectivity. Um, as everybody basically knows, you know, there's little or poor uh, connectivity down in the southern area. And then throughout the park, the, the trail system is so confusing and there's so many little deer trails and um, and it's it was very it's very difficult to actually like navigate your way through to a place you actually want to go to. You might find your yourself somewhere, but and it's an incredible experience. But at the same time, if you actually want to get to a specific space, it can be difficult. So then, looking at the solutions of Shelby Farms Park, they they had a three pronged approach to create one park or and create that sense of identity to plant 1 million trees and then to define 12 landscape rooms. Keep in mind, of course, going back here, uh, Shelby Farms Park is massive. So, you know, how those 12 rooms are, um, they work very well because it is so massive. And so applying those to Franklin Park, I kind of saw these four main areas in the park, and I'll go into this later, of um, four different hearts of the park. 
and then the, instead of planting 1 million trees, I think uh, quite a few actually need to be cut back and so that the canopy and the species are healthier and there's more, um, there's, uh, more diversity of experience. And then the 12 landscape rooms applied here, I identified quite a few of the existing programmatic areas and then some new programmatic areas to focus on. So a few things of inspiration while I was there, um, just the drumlins, they're so cool. They are really grand in a lot of ways and they, uh, this hill in particular was one of my favorite spaces. There was no program there or anything. It was just kind of cleared out and you could really feel the drumlin and walking on top of it and just experiencing those um, interior views of this little area here. And then um, of course the actual, um, the actual rocks, the pudding stone, and you know, you can actually feel it and be immersed in it. And then the big open valley views. Um, this is Scarborough Pond looking down into Scarborough Pond from this hillside. So, um, so yeah, I really, you know, was very inspired by the topography. So then looking at the community analysis and the general analysis of Franklin Park, we of course have our neighborhoods, um, our prominent neighborhoods here and what I noticed was that on while we were there and through the analysis that there's really poor connection between the eastern side to the western side and it seemed like the western communities had kind of like almost staked their claim on this wilderness area. So I wanted to pull people from all over into the whole park and not just into these outer lying areas. And again, through the analysis, essentially disconnected experience, both visually because of all of that understory, overgrown understory, then socially, um, the gathering spaces were disjointed. And then of course that east-west divide, and then the physical disconnection of their, the boundaries are um, in quite a few places difficult to enter. And then naturally not a lot of universal access for ADA. Here's some sections just showing, you know, what's going on um, through that analysis, the canopy cover, what programs are happening, um, and that really informed how I wanted to approach this final phase of the project, which was to um, unite the park and create a sense of identity, and then to showcase these, these incredible landforms. So to do that, I really landed on this idea of a, a prominent connection from the north to the south or south to north that would help enhance the neighborhood prior, uh, porosity. And then that main spine would connect to the Emerald Necklace Greenbelt Trail and um, to allow for cross connection and then to link between those different hearts within the park and thus the Discovery Trail actually becomes its own program. So putting that over this larger neighborhood map, um, we can see how these main moves are trying to pull everybody together into the park, but also up into Boston, out into the communities, and then also to the Emerald Necklace. And here is the existing trails and roadways map. Um, just and then highlighting some programs along um, along some of these more prominent trails, the wider trails especially, and then how can we connect those to create a better journey through the park? So looking at more at the circulation and other pathways that would be put within the park. And then those distances and trail times to just understand like what's actually feasible. Um, so far, the longest trail is this Discovery Trail and it's 2.6 miles. So 39 to 52 minutes, depending on how fast you walk. And then going more into the four 
parts of how that trail will actually connect to those four different hearts um, with especially the biggest move being the southern heart where the maintenance facility is being converted more into an urban garden <clears throat> and community space. And then here's some more of those programs <clears throat> along the Discovery Trail. And then what type of landforms would people actually experience while there? Um, the, these lighter orange are the larger drumlins in the area than these less um, less light or these darker orange areas are more topographic interest points and then these very dark orange areas are um, man man influenced or manufactured mounds and so walking along the trail you would experience quite a bit of highs and lows in the valleys and then on the hilltop and then the vegetation. So essentially looking at Olmsted's vision and then currently how much is overgrown. And then so a proposal of thinning back, opening up those views, um, clearing invasives and planting some trees to enhance that experience of open and enclosure, which you would see here. Quite a few places have both open openness and enclosure, and then a transition of looking into those other spaces. So here is the final plan put all together and how, again, this would actually connect this Southern community, especially in Mattapan and the lower parts of Dorchester up into Roxbury and the Northern parts of Jamaica Plain. And, um, and then how the other trails actually work together so that, again, as a spine, the Discovery Trail links into these other trails to spread people or give people access into other parts of the park. So doing some character studies to figure out what the actual trail will look like. Um, I looked at site specific areas to understand what that hilltop and valley would look like, that openness and enclosure, and then what shadow, not just shade, but shadow of the hills from the um, east to west and then north to south. And then the actual trail, the width and what type of character it would have. Um, would it be more of this like cracked, cracked earth style or would it be sunken? or would there be a dramatic change in the hill to a flat area? And then lastly, the human scale of what type of typology, path typology and seating typology could be found throughout the trail to unite it as a, not only just the prominent trail, but to give this experience of, I'm on the discovery trail versus any other trail. So let's take a walk. So we will um, start at the south entrance and then work our way to the north. And the first is of course the south entrance and just showing of course um, the distance to and from the south or the north entrance. Of course it's zero from the south entrance. And um, this is really about connecting that southern and eastern community unity to the rest of the park. And here we have a perspective of people entering the park and what the path typology be, would be, which I'm thinking as in each of the nodes along the, the trail, when it comes to the actual node, the path material changes into, for the most part, this granite these granite pavers. And then once you get back onto the trail, it actually goes back to um, a gravel. So we can see how that would work. And then also um, uh, big pudding stone boulders would be anchor, would help anchor each of the nodes to the discovery trail and to show visitors, you know, hey, this is a spot. This is a place where um, I, I can explore more. And here are the boulders with a seating included. And um, these would be like cut out essentially with a different type of granite placed in. And then to 
from the south entrance, we would cross Scarborough Pond and get to Scarborough Lookout, where it's summertime now. And I, I see this as having um, quite a bit of internal park activities, whether it's fireworks or picnicking. And this, this area right here, which is right here, is actually a natural amphitheater, um, kind of a bowl shape for gatherings and for viewings. And then on our way up to the wilderness, we would pass Schoolmaster Hill and come to the wilderness where the canopy and, um, and ecology is a major connection with a elevated boardwalk here. And this would be wood, an elevated boardwalk that would actually connect right back to the Discovery Trail. And this would allow people to get up into the canopy and experience that different viewpoint. And then on our way to the Playstead, we would pass a the Woodlands Trailhead, the Overlook Ruins, and we would get to here. And this is a wintertime scene of what this could look like with um, the pathway during the wintertime being a trail of lights or, or some sort of um, festival or you know, holiday type of program to bring people into this area. And you can really see, especially with the snow, how these mounds um, give, you know, they're of course an abstraction of the drumlins, but they really give a human scale experience of, of those drumlins by being able to run and, and roll down them and sit on them. And then we would pass the Boston Overlook and Bear Dens area to get to the north entrance. And so we are done with this walk and we will land on this place, uh, on this page in review. So again, this Discovery Trail really hopes to enhance the neighborhood porosity, promote cross connection and access, link park program, and it becomes its own program. With that, thank you. I'm open to your feedback. Can I just ask a question because it's it's um, strong on on the plan. The um, the the real specificity of the kind of alignment of that path and the changing of the width of it because you had talked about how you have made some studies about how the path might might work um and um uh, can you just talk a little bit about how you made the decision to to draw it in that way sure um the at most at most destinations or nodes, the path widens to, in some cases, 20, 25 feet. For the most part, it stays about 10 feet all along uh, between those nodes. Um, as for the shaping of the actual path, for the most part, I really followed existing trails, um, but made those connections where there was a broken, there was a broken trail connection, especially between the Schoolmaster Hill and Scarborough Hill. Um, and then, um, and then as for the actual path materials, just really trying to highlight that you've, you've reached a destination and then, you know, you're here, but then once you're ready to go, like, okay, I, I know this, this is the trail. This is the discovery trail, um, where I found that while while we were visiting, it was so confusing to know exactly which was which. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I will jump in. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, um, um, I'm, just, I'm not even going to ask you where the golfers go. Uh, we're just going <laughs> to they've gone somewhere else. Um, I think it's a really beautiful project. Um, uh, I, I appreciate the way that you have 
um, that you were really motivated by and inspired by what you saw out there. I just liked even seeing those photographs reminding me what a beautiful place it is because I think it's it's one of those things that when you visit it and, and the nice thing about visiting the winter is not the temperatures, but because the leaves are all down and everything's mowed and um, you, you can get to all of the places that you can't get to when all of that, you know, invasive understory is up and you can see the landforms so beautifully and there is no other place like it in Boston. So um, mm -hmm. I agree with you entirely on that. And it feels, the project really feels like you, um, in your time there, you, you looked carefully at the qualities of the place um, and have uh, managed to insert a new project that um, feels while new and and you would you would be able to recognize it as its own thing feels very in keeping with um, the sort of the, the character of the land so um, uh, I appreciate that um, I, I guess one thing that I would um, I would love to see is um, how this this project might, um, you know, sort of the four hearts. Um, like I don't know if this is an artery. What's the smaller thing, you know, than an artery? And to really, even if you had done it very diagrammatically, to show how people could do so, like smaller loops. Like at now, it's kind of a one-way system. I have to go this way, and then either I come all the way back, or I, to your point, try to figure out on the very, you know, opaque trail system that exists how I get back to where I came from yeah. um, and you know your counter that if it if it's a you know two and a half mile what if I just want to go you know to Scarborough Hill Overlook and back but I would like a different route on the way back so you wouldn't even have to design it so much as just identify um, you know sort of like mini loops at different yeah. scales that would allow people to get out into the heart that you identified and then back to the artery and out into the heart and back to the artery. And then I think that, you know, the, the route that you've taken north to south gives you the greatest length if you're doing what is essentially a kind of straight line, a, a squished up straight line. But, um, you know, you had made the original observation about how east doesn't meet west and this doesn't solve that. So, again, how you might like allow arteries that could be maybe much less designed, but a similar color paving or something that just gets you to either existing entrances or new entrances, which could be other of these mm -hmm. iconic moments. And they would be named, you know, the, you know, I don't know, great rock entrance and the like, you know, yeah, <laughs> whatever the viburnum entrance and you would kind of, have these places that would be iconic either vegetally or in terms of the material that you're using or an adjacency in the neighborhood and that naming um the history of naming of places that olmstead um originated would continue as part of your project so it's more it's less about i i don't have a lot of um you know comments about what you've done it's more um which i think is is quite beautiful and the drawings are really beautiful um it's more about how you could achieve some of the goals that you had mentioned early on. I think I would appreciate just like a straight up um, like dimension section at certain intervals. So I really understood like a 10 foot path that gets to 20 feet. It's that's mm -hmm. not a big space if you're trying to have a lot of people there and 10 foot is, you know, having it be consistently 10 feet. Is that right or not? And that's so that's one thing that while the the perspectives are incredibly beautiful and very convincing in terms of, for me, in terms of materials and your understanding of vegetation and the phenomenal qualities of your different hearts and the seasons that like, you know, straight up, is this the right size of yeah. thing in the, in the different places would be something to test for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Very helpful. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I completely concur. I, my, my one comment was how this started to fit in with smaller loops, mm -hmm. right? Which start to reinforce the triangle, right? Yeah. Of connectivity that you were uh, you were aiming uh, to make. 
one of the things I most appreciate about the project is that it reads as a series of really discrete interventions as opposed to a complete remaking, though it is a remaking. What I don't have a sense of, and I think Kristen's in, uh, questions, you know, um, moved toward this was the size of these interventions or how much were you eating away from mm -hmm. historic parts or from the golf course in order to right, achieve this. And, yeah. you know, I don't, I'm not advocating for you making a room, but everything here is a passage, right? Mm -hmm. And then there are furnishings that begin to occupy edges, but when do they become truly spatial? Is it, it's not, is it just an opening up of the canopy and the ground plane? Or, you know, when is it making smaller rooms, right? Or transitions. And so yeah. um, for different numbers and groups of people. And I think that, that's the, right, that's what happens next week, right? But I think, <laughs> you know, that's where, that's where I was, um, you know, that's where I was looking, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, but I, I have to admit the discrete, linking together and the scale getting towards scale because <laughs> I think some of these nodes appear to me to be sort of scale less or too large I don't know mm -hmm. um, also um, I want to know why you don't why do you need to insert granite on the pudding stone seat when cutting through and revealing that hot Amalgam of stuff is probably one of the coolest parts of pudding stone. Noted. I will. I will do that. <laughs> oh, Laura, um, Laura, Laura, I mean, I laugh <laughs> or clapped. <laughs> coming from a mid-Atlantic state, I thought that pudding stone was the coolest stuff ever. It is so cool. Yeah. It this. I. I. And I guess to your point of the discreteness is. I mean, this park is so incredible as it is. It, it um, if anything, it just it needs some like love and some brushing up and dusting off. And um, but it's it's a really cool park. So I didn't want to say like all of this is bad. It all needs to go away, and I'm going to do something new. You know, I really did try to kind of stay in line with um, with what was existing. But the fact that management plays a role in this, can where do you make the connection back to the care work mm. portion of the semester? Or Gina, do you want me to be quiet? I will. But, no, <laughs> no, no. I think it's a well, great question. That's where I, that's yeah. as I as I say goodbye and thank you, right? <laughs> and I let you take over. That's my last question. Okay, thank you. I'll I'll just um, say that. A lot of what um, Maggie really discussed during the lectures throughout the semester, if anything, um, I was really focused or I was drawn more to the equity side of, of feminism. And I've always been more drawn to that side of feminism, um, not just the genderness, um, mm -hmm. which I know that's not what she was lecturing about, but that's the term feminism really gets me in that sense of you know, I, I don't want it to be gendered. I think it should be completely equitable, an equitable approach. So how, how do I, I that, that's really where I was focusing on the neighborhood connection to the park, not so much the maintenance and, and that, that form of care. So, yeah. I think um, I'll just jump in and be brief because um, I really agree with them. Um, what Kristen and, and Hope said. Um, and then I would just add, I really uh, thought that your taking us through your thought process was really helpful. Um, you know, clearly there was such a um, thoughtful way that you looked at precedence, but then also looked at the park. Um, and so that was that was a really nice way to way to start. Um, I think the, you know, the one thing you've heard from both um, Hope and Kristen, and you'll hear from me too, is the um, kind of way to break this down. And I think one way to think about that would be how different people might use it um, and, and need to use it. And, you know, someone who um, like is, in, is older and maybe can't walk as far, what does their occupation of it look like? Um, 
you know, versus like Hope was saying, different different sizes of groups. We heard a lot that there's different um, uh, communities around the park that use it in different ways. And, you know, there's the solo dog walkers that have a big contingency. And then there's also people who, um, the park to them means a place to go with family and friends. So how does that look different um, with this kind of, this new space that you've created in the middle? Um, mm -hmm. It is really nice because we've been thinking a lot about the, the edges and the edges as being the place that hold a lot of programming and, um, you know, freeing yourself of the, of the golf course. Um, suddenly this is really a place that um, this, this trail that it doesn't feel like it already belongs to one community or another. So I think that's a huge opportunity. And I think um, it would be nice to think about how these places that you're creating along at the nodes, maybe start to express some of the community um, within them and, and what that looks like, whether that's, you know, designed for different use or within the design itself. Um, a little bit like the um, first project was inspired by the parade route. Um, like, is there some kind of cultural story that could inspire a little bit what happens in these places too? Um, but I think like, like others said, just a really nice project and really successful at multiple scales, um, which was nice to see. Um, you started out by talking about kind of the bigger system of connectivity beyond the park too, and that might be a nice place to come back to at the end, because that is so important um, to Boston's park system. So that would just be yeah. one final thought. Okay, awesome. Very, very helpful. These are all awesome, awesome feedback. Thank y'all so much. Catherine, those, those uh, perspectives are just so spectacular. I mean, the, you know, she was looking at, you guys, she was looking at like West States, um, was Houston Botanic Garden or something, mm -hmm. drawings. And, and I just think there's something really nice about the landing of the reading of place, the design intervention, and then this layer of seasonality that's just really spectacular and really sums up your project. It's really nice to see uh, you come to this conclusion and think about the whole journey. Uh, yeah. Both well, in terms of the discovery it, trail and the, and the studio. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all's guidance. Y'all really, really helped me shape and form this. So, um, Beautiful. yeah, much, much appreciated, everybody. Those drawings Beautiful work. somehow really do, do feel like Franklin Park, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I was thinking, Brie, you know, we talk a lot about like um, mm -hmm. in our studio about how we really want our drawings to be looser and more emotive, you know, and like not so resolved. And I think there's something really nice and you resolved what you needed to and left open-ended sort of these big long views and um, mm -hmm. it's just really spectacular. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well done. Thank so, you um, so much. So hope has a hard stop. I think we have one more that we were scheduled for. We started late, so we're running a little late. Do you all want to just do the fifth talk now and then take a half hour break? Um, or do you want to reconvene at 2.30 your time there in Texas, 3.30 our time, and plow through five in the afternoon? Critic's choice. I can do Any one more. I would keep One. going, yeah. And okay, it. okay. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. okay Tahira, you're up. Okay, hello everyone. Let me share my screen. Oh boy, starting with, okay, <laughs> here's the first slide. Um, my name is Tahira and um, the title of my project is uh, Change the Narrative Addressing Homelessness. Um, I'm looking at Franklin Park through the lens of equity. And so just to begin, um, I looked at the demographics at the state city level and at the um, three districts uh, directly touching Franklin Park. Um, after diving to my precedent study, which was 11th Street Bridge in Washington, D.C., um, I began my research looking at these demographics. And so um, the total population of Massachusetts is 6,902,000, um, and they have a 10% poverty level, which totals 690,000 people, which is almost the equivalent of the entire population of Boston. 
um, which has a 18.2% poverty level, which is 126,000 people. And so moving forward, um, diving into the uh, deeper the population of Roxbury, Jamaica Plain and Mattapan, um, I broke it down by uh, race and also median household income and unemployment rates because these are things that influence um, the higher poverty levels. Um, Mattapan having the highest unemployment rate and Roxbury having the lowest median household income. And so um, something that was prevalent in all three districts was their um, homeless population. Um, they're all working to lower their, um, to lower the percentage of homelessness in their neighborhoods. And so this is just the diagrammatic map of uh, neighboring uh, shelters around the park and the direct access to the park, um, like the relationship to it. And so here is listed um, a few of the shelters that I found to be within walking distance um, to the park. Um, overall, Massachusetts has 20,000 homeless people, Boston 6,000, and there are almost 4,000 shelters and services. And so this is just a few that I highlighted. And so um, on this map is just a really specific bubble over the building itself and showing um, who each of these shelters are serving. Um, the Stacy Kirkpatrick House is healthcare, surgery, recovery. Um, the Boston Family Shelter um, takes the housing first approach where they try to give people housing um, before they put them in homeless, sh like emergency shelter. Um, the Revision Home is um, focused on women and children. They have an urban farm that they um, farm, they, they grow to sell at their farm stand. Um, the Brookview House is a youth development uh, program and about 88% of their students graduate high school. Um, the Pine Street Inn at, um, at the Shattuck Hospital location um, serve, serves 120 men. Um, they, it provides life and skills training and tries to um, help them go back into society. Um, the Horizons for Homeless Children is for early education under five years old. The Pine Street Inn and Inc. Um, serves about 2,700 meals a day in the Casa Nueva Vida addresses Hispanic homelessness. And so um, this is just a map of, can you see me moving um, the videos around? Like your thumbnails, can you, can you guys see that? Or is that just me? I don't see what you're- Okay, so it's just me. Um, it's like the video showing everybody's faces. Like I could see it on my screen. But I was wondering if you guys could see on the screen. You can change it to here in the upper right. There's a few options. If it's distracting to you, you could try um, in the upper right. Just got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, this is just a map of the sites of interest and why they were chosen and just a few um, things that I noticed while I was there. Um, so the homeless shelter on site, the Pine Street Inn, um, when I spoke to the administration there, he said that they needed improvement on their uh, skills and life training programs. Um, the hospital on site uh, houses 260 uh, patients, um, but they're relocating the hospital and displacing all the nonprofits. And so I saw that as an opportunity. Um, the maintenance yard um, had the greenhouses and horses and um, it seemed kind of neglected of a, of a way. And so um, I was thinking about adaptive reuse of the buildings and also the materials that are just scattered across and then the revision home because of the agriculture and aquacultural skills. Um, and so um, what I wanted to focus my project on is reversing the negative stereotypes between um, the homeless population and parks. Um, and this is just a quick diagram of the relationship between a human and a park. Um, with when it comes to maintenance and uh, recreational spaces, stabilizing ecological systems, um, and then nature promoting physical activity, um, improving uh, mood and health and things of that sort. And so um, something that I saw the park as 
is a way like a campus to put in affordable housing, nonprofits, life skills training, like an educational hub um, to ease the transition um, of the homeless population back into society. And so um, I dove into a few precedent studies. Um, the Levin Street Bridge was the one I started off with. Um, the Superkillen Park in Denmark um, is urban space connecting a really diverse neighborhood um, through like art installations and um, they have a recreation space, a resting space, things of that sort. The Homeless Garden Project in Santa Cruz is a nine acre urban farm. Um, and they just see the farming as like a therapeutic way of life. Um, and they sell the produce to the community. Um, and then the Haven for Hope in San Antonio, um, they combined a lot of different services in one area just to make it uh, really accessible for those who typically wouldn't have access. So it's healthcare, education, um, work, things of that sort. And so my framework, um, which is drawn from my precedent studies, um, I narrowed everything down to three spheres of grow, work, and play, which would also include like housing, community interaction, training, education, et cetera, um, just to make an equitable project. Um, these spheres will be um, tied together with the yellow brick road, which I just imagine as the optimal path for pedestrians. Um, and so this yellow brick road would expand and contract as it interacts with these three uh, spheres throughout um, the Shattuck Hospital maintenance yard strip. And so this is just a topography map of the park and um, I'll zoom in on the maintenance yard because I saw that as a hub, like a meeting ground for um, just to activate the southern tip and also give um, a better access to the southern um, communities because they had less homeless shelters. And so this is just the, um, the axon of the existing buildings that were there and just kind of keynotes. Um, because the Boston Parks and Recreation Department maintenance offices are in this um, area, the greenhouses, the horse stable, and then various sheds. Um, I dimensionized the entire site, I have about 20,000 square feet of office space um, that I decided to keep moving forward. And then I put in the yellow brick road just as the entrance and exit. Um, this is just um, me calling out what I envision it being. And so Playscape Agriculture Work Hub, those are the three spheres. Um, I did a quick Photoshop of a playscape, urban farm, and a gazebo. And I removed the buildings that I didn't see fit my, um, my vision, basically. And so then I overlaid um, what I, the contracting and, ex, you know, the expanded contraction of my yellow brick road throughout the maintenance yard to just create um, a pedestrian focused experience. Um, and then I labeled out like a courtyard, a front yard, which I envision as like a place where they can sell their urban produce that's grown. The backyard is like a garage for the maintenance equipment. Um, and then the equine uh, therapy loop, horse riding, which is really therapeutic. Um, yeah. And so these are some um, perspectives of the courtyard. And this is the front yard, which I just see people um, like having a picnic and just various activities, but like an open gathering space. Um, here's a section of the horse stable. Um, and then I have here the little playscape in the background, added some trees. And then this is the office building section. Um, and I just see the office as having like a library lounge, a training room, offices, which is where the, um, you know, people will go, um, you know, just to learn new skills, um, 
resume building activities, just um, trying to figure things out, just to smooth that transition back into society. And this is a section of the greenhouses um, and the agriculture. And so I just put in, um, yeah, and this is the equine therapy loop as well. And so this is just a quick visualization of what I imagine the campus being um, in the green lounge is like a, a basically a greenhouse with, a, you know, a couch and a couple chairs in it. And that would conclude my project. Maybe um, to hear, you want to go back to the um, oblique kind of of the maintenance yard? Yeah, one of these. Okay, um, here's a few things that I really appreciate. One is, you know, in your proposal, you are going to force the conversation about the design language between the historic uh, language of Olmsted and materials and the insertion of the yellow brick road, right? And I have to admit, I really appreciate that of the yellow brick road when I, when I look back at your original framework where there was the programmatic spheres, but it was really the collage where in each way, right? No matter which cultural group, which way in which you chose to express yourself, right? There was a combination of materials, textures and elements. And I think that that it would really cause a, a moment of reflection when you think about the historic language versus the contemporary language, which is which reflects your objectives. So I found that an interesting use of contrast and difference. Um, and that it also has its own circulation route or identifier um, that connects all these all the services that are part of your public outreach and uh, in a public park, right, city park, metropolitan park uh, language. And so there, those are things that I really appreciate. What I wonder is, you know, and so here's, you know, the contrast in me, right, difference or uh, is that does it read, you called it a campus. Mm -hmm. And so I found that quite intriguing, right, because it brings together all these different sets of functions. So but a campus has a language, right? And it has an organizational system. So you have chosen to keep a lot of the existing structures, but how have you changed the, organi the formal organizational systems of buildings and open space so that it reads as a campus? Or are you saying the, the what, we need to identify or link us is only the path. Um, for me, um, the path, well, the buildings did have a lot to do with how the path was drawn, um, just because I wanted to take um, the pedestrian through open, closed, playscape agriculture, you know, just carrying them through all the different um, activities. Um, but I mostly see the path as um, even though I didn't add or take away, um, I didn't take too much away from the buildings itself, I didn't reorganize them, um, I do see the path as an organization. Okay, great, because that's a different way, because if you think about our campus right now, right, the tower and uh, the building, right, it has an axis that goes in all directions, right, and it brings all of those elements to that central place. You don't have an axis. You didn't build the axis. You didn't rebuild the axis. You have a path. Right. And so it's the material that links and joins us all. Not unlike Speedway. <laughs> Pardon me? Not unlike? I feel like Speedway. A speedway. Speedway is UT's yellow brick road. We have a yellow brick road. <laughs> but our yellow brick road is pretty central with a series of sub axes. So that's where I'm asking you, 
is it how do you achieve the campus when you're only using the path as opposed to formal tools as well so it's a challenge based upon what you've presented to us, which is a compelling argument. Well, I think that um, the reason why I called it a campus, um, although it might not be the typical campus, I just saw it as a middle ground for um, more like a hub, you know, for the homeless population to feel safe and uh, feel like they belong and have a, like a place in society. And so I just saw that as like a place for um, them to come together and do something constructive for the environment, the community and the park. And so, um, although I don't have like a monumental thing, um, that is my intention behind using the word campus. Okay, no, I agree, it is a campus. And I don't disagree with you calling it a campus at all. But there, right, nothing monumental. So what is the organizational system that you use that puts everything as equal? I'm thinking of a modified grid of sorts. Right, where there is no one element, but where all things are interconnected, right? And there's multiple ways in which you can set up an organizational system. So that was my, that was my question, was really looking at the formal organizational system for your campus. It was very academic kind of question. Well, um, I was inspired by Olmsted. <laughs> organic pathways and so I try to emulate that <laughs> uh, with you know the curving of my yellow brick road and that in a way organize the space um, depending on the program but I don't I'm not entirely sure how else to answer your question <laughs> I think you just did okay <laughs> I was like I don't know <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, but interestingly enough, right, it's a journey and the yellow brick road is a journey. And so, uh, you know, that's another way in which you, another way in which you could um, describe organizing it, right? Sustenance, therapy, shelter. So very good, thank you. Thank you. Um, here, can you go back again to the, um, I'm probably going to say just the same thing Hope said in a different way. So you can, you know, tell, you know, be like, Ugh, I heard this already, but go, if you go back to your, um, the zoomed out diagram, your kind of party in the, I guess, colored pencil. I think that, you know, I, I also deeply appreciate that you have identified a community for whom your work is an advocate. Um, and I think the sighting of, um, you know, the sighting of your campus is really smart. And, um, you know, looking at the, um, let me get my annotate out, looking at, um, looking at the party on the right, you know, if you think about the Shattuck as the place that people are going for treatment and that this is the place where they're transitioning and then ultimately they end up back out in the neighborhoods um, in a kind of healthier and more stable place. Thinking about that edge as the journey that Hope is talking about, there's both a kind of programmatic and, um, life, and life journey that's happening. And then there's the spatial journey that you are creating as a designer that has, you know, is described in plan here. Um, if you then go, can you go back to the AXO? So I think it's just, it's a beautiful idea and the way that you have been, I mean, there's something, those buildings are kind of like messed up, but there's also something quite beautiful about the history of them. And, um, and I think the way that you have as a programming plan and as a programmed campus, the project is 
really very strong. It's, it's I, I think the way that you have reused, thought about reusing buildings and how buildings, the relationships of the faces of these buildings that exist create landscape spaces that you're capitalizing on is fantastic. And how you're thinking about um, uh, the use and the different kinds of architectural programs that would happen and, and how they would, what they would look like in those sections is a real is really clear what's what's less maybe clear and i think this was hope was getting at and i i think maybe you have just underestimated your abilities as a landscape architect to um to sculpt space so you have like incredibly intelligently identified spaces that exist and how to program them but maybe giving yourself less credit um, for manipulating the space to be what you want it to be. And I think that's really hard to do. It, it takes, you know, years. And there are times, you know, even now where I'm doing things and I just think I suck at this. I am just never going to get good at this. So, but the way you get better is through conversation, but then also through making stuff. And I wonder if there are other ways of making that you can hmm. engage that would help you see the power that you have in making space and therefore make your yellow brick road. Um, like it, in some places it's really following existing, um, existing paths and maybe that's exactly where you want your paths to be. But I would love to see a series of studies where you say, you know, F that. I'm, I'm going to leave the buildings and I'm going to program these spaces and then I'm going to exactly put this path where I want it to be for the journey that I want to take people on and here I want it dug into a hillside and here I want it like flat, flat, flat on a lawn so you feel that incredible beauty and expanse of flatness and here the, you know, agriculture may be terraced and I let people kind of move downstairs and move through these bands of planting and um, so I was never very good at drawing in school and I found modeling really helpful, even if I did it in chipboard and clay. And it was a quick, quick way of me understanding how a path overlaid a you know, lawn over and I made space or clay, which we've seen. And I think you, you, know, you clearly can use um, model to, to, to understand things and act so, but I would love to see you find a way to, you know, maybe let's go to your sections for a second. Um, yeah. So the clearest thing on the section is the building. Um, and, and I think that if you were to draw your plan and then take sections of your plan, um, and then decide, where's my stupid annotation stuff? I've lost my controls. Um, so if you say here, I have a slope and then there's a flat and then there's kind of a slope again. And really I want this playscape to be flat. Pretend that's a flat line. Um, I want that playscape to be flat, which means that I'm up here now and I have to get back down here. So do I want it to be a slope? Do I want it to be a series of stairs? Do I want it to be a wall? Um, and just drawing over your drawings in a way that you're testing spatial ideas. This is my front yard. I want trees coming up here. Um, I, I want this to be flat or I want this to be a slightly mounded space um, or I want it to be a series of terraces that are separated by embankments. Um, and you could do some very quick sketches because clearly you're really good at drawing too and, and just be more aggressive. I think probably maybe aggression is not in your nature, but be like more aggressive with the land about shaping it so that the space is expressive of your ideas about what beauty is and how people should use it and that maybe you know pathways always have trees along them or um, uh, lawns are divided by embankments or you know 
to, I think what Hope is trying to say is like, you have the power to make decisions about what landscape tools you're using to sculpt space in the same way you made really clear decisions about how you are, where you're putting programs, program in and just be, um, be, be more aggressive about it. And, and then the, the kind of clarity and where we can really imagine what the space of these um, interior spaces are like and how these people would use them and feel um, you know, transported, we would be able to see that in your outdoor spaces too. So just confidence, girl, just, you know, just do it. I have a be more aggressive idea too. Um, and if you go back to um, your framework, um, I think you did such a nice job at the beginning of kind of like doing deep research into the community services and the program providers and the issue, um, and then arriving at this kind of grow, work, play framework to kind of drive your program decisions. Um, you had a really good foundation. And then when I saw this kind of um, framework diagram and was reminded of Shattuck and the kind of eating into the park of that that happened a while ago and has now kind of become permanent. The maintenance yard, um, which also has eaten into the public uh, area of the park. I almost, and then you kind of presented this like, this is such a big issue. Um, and, you know, in Boston, affordable housing is like the number one issue. There's just not enough housing um, and all the development pressures around the neighborhood. It just made me think maybe this whole um, Southwestern edge isn't park. It's like, you know, the city, what they don't have is money. Um, and what in Boston land is, is money. And so is it worth it to, you know, the way that the um, Franklin Park Master Plan that we're doing now is funded, um, or the way the implementation will be funded is $28 million um, the city got by selling one parking garage downtown, um, which will be redeveloped and, and all of that. And so when the city doesn't have power, oftentimes they own land and they can use that to leverage an outcome that they wanna see. And so they could say, we have this band that has already become degraded as park. Um, and maybe this needs to be kind of like dedicated property that we think about. Are there spaces that we give away that we co-develop for affordable housing? Um, but we really need to to do something bolder around around this um, this problem, and so it could be like your maintenance yard solution from a programming perspective at a much bigger scale, um, or it could be a way that they generate a lot of money to invest in in these programs. But I think that you told such a kind of clear story around need and what the um, outcomes are that you could almost make the case for we need to we need to rethink this edge of the park as park. Um, and you know, that's like sacrilege in a lot of ways, but we also didn't worry too much when the golf course went away, you know, yeah. and so there's, <laughs> you know, in a way losing this would be kind of, um, I, I think it's at, it's at the same level of question of kind of what what is important. Here. Yeah. So I think, um, I don't know, Kristen or Brie, I don't know probably knows this, but um, Tahara is one of our, undergraduate architecture mm -hmm. and so it was a lot for her to bite into uh an own study in park i almost said it's almost like you're an architect yeah so, <laughs> so, I, I, I was gonna say that how'd you like <laughs> grouped well, in with all of us but i think it's you know. a I, so i do think it's a whole new skill set about thinking yeah. about space and i think it's really nice that you got a really nice crit to hear and i think it's a really comprehensive project um i wonder just uh because hope going to take off shortly if you could tell her since this is um, a new kind of studio for you just what the studio has been like for you I know you've shared a number of times that this is different than a lot of studios you've taken in terms of your relationship to the subject matter yeah um I don't know like I really enjoyed the studio honestly um it was really nice to kind of take a break away from architecture, not really, but <laughs> it was just nice to not think about architecture. Um, and so this definitely was completely out of my comfort zone and um, 
but I had a good time. I wish that, you know, I had a little bit longer to be bold about landscaping, but, <laughs> you know, like I didn't really know too much about that. I was just like, okay, you'll pass. But, um, yeah. but I did enjoy um, the studio a lot and like, um, Maggie and Gina pushed me really hard to even get to this point. So I appreciate that as well. Here, you know, here's the good thing, right? Um, oh, I meant to say the yellow brick road reminded me of the Super Keelan or whatever, Biggs Park, right? Couldn't help but think about that. But yeah, that was the precedent. <laughs> that was the precedent. So here's the thing, here's the, here's the, the strongest thing, right? Just because it's landscape architecture, doesn't you know you're you you're manipulating your materials the scale of the spaces right start is is very different um remember i started out in architecture before i found my way to landscape architecture but um that but the skill set that you have right and that you've been prepared for and you don't have to pretend to be a landscape architect you know, what you have in this opportunity is a chance to expand your palette of materials. And so that is what you have achieved this semester. So yeah, don't worry. Uh, you don't have to be a landscape architect, um, but you're still applying your same skill sets, right? Um, just at a different scale and a different time frame. Right. But what I appreciate about landscape architecture and about your project is the way that it begins to dovetail so directly with a social agenda. Yep. And I was going to make a plug with that for some planning classes too. There you go. <laughs> it seems like you have an affinity. <laughs> I'll see Tahira on campus. I'll <laughs> defer to all y'all. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, team. So I think we're going to take a break. Maggie, are you okay if we say 30 minutes? Team, everyone, come back here at 2.40. Mm -hmm. 3.40 our time, East Coasters. Yeah. Sound good? Great. Yeah, great. Appreciate it, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, morning you. people. That was great. It was yes. really nice to meet all of you. Nice to thank see you. Thank you so much, Hope. Oh, no, my pleasure. You graduate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to with, uh, with Phoebe. I'm going to tune in. I'm going to tune in to see the rest of you graduating students and encourage. Yes, please. Yes, you're all submitting to ASLA, aren't you? Oh, yes, they are. Yes, they are. <laughs> okay. Okay. See you in a little bit, guys. All right. Ciao. Thank nice you. to meet everyone. Uh, thank you. Okay. Hey, Phoebe. All right. Uh, should I start? Um, let's see. I think we are still make sure I have a, I have to let Kristen in. There we go. Okay. Great. So, so Phoebe, do you know Kristen Fredrickson or Bree? Have you met? I, I have not met either in person. Okay. So here they are via Zoom. <laughs> Kristen's a principal at Reed Hilda Branch. She's uh, been teaching on Franklin Park and, um, and uh, is obviously part of Reed Hildebrand that's leading the master plan and Bree, my business partner, who's a planner, um, just wrapped up a semester at GSD. So teaching MUP, MUPs. And that's Phoebe. Hi. <laughs> the Phoebe. <laughs> and Hi everyone. Two Phoebes. <laughs> Two Phoebes. We've, it's, and Phoebe, you're kicking us off, huh? Yes. All right, cool. Okay. Uh, can everyone see the screen? Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, all right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Phoebe Chang, and uh, my project um, examines Franklin Park at the intersection of um, socially divided neighborhoods. Um, so located about four miles away from downtown Boston, uh, Franklin Park borders some of the largest neighborhoods in Boston. Um, 
including Jamaica Plain in the west of the park, and then Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan in the east. Um, throughout the preliminary analysis, I was struck by the overarching challenge of that disparity between the distinct neighborhoods, um, which has caused a divide between the east and the west side of the Franklin Park. Um, this disparity is multifaceted, but most evidently um, the racial disparities between the white populations uh, in the west and the people of color in the east side. Um, the social uh, economic factors, such as the median household income, um, unemployment rates, education levels, et cetera, further exacerbates that divide. And then additionally, um, the programmatic inequalities, um, which uh, namely the restricted use of the golf course here and then the zoo are uh, pushing against that east side of the park, which further um, guards people away um, on the east side from entering into the park. And then so with the uh, challenges comes the opportunities, uh, which includes the park's role, future role, um, of good, becoming this common ground for all su surrounding neighborhoods and then providing clarity um, to uh, the entries to establish a stronger connection points and then um, providing porosity and then find opportunities for engagement um, and invitation that could happen along the edges of the park. Um, so further analysis that I conducted include um, examining the uh, examination of all the park entries and then building a um, user group profile um, based on the surrounding neighborhood residents and then so here are the five groups that i have identified um, which includes school kids um, which obviously have a need for space for play and education um, and then the next group is a socially vulnerable group um, this is a very general term but contains a wide range of challenging uh, needs including people of color people of disabilities people of low income and education levels etc so this group is the most contained um, physically, socially, and psychologically. So trying to engage them on the park's edges where they're currently um, already gathering around the major bus stops would be a huge opportunity. Um, both the single family with the strollers and the dog walker and the runners are your daily park users that have a need for safety and accessibility for daily engagement with the park. And then lastly, the um, general park visitors um, that are mostly accessing the uh, park by car. So then I matched um, these user groups with the existing types of entrances that I've identified um, around the edges of Franklin Park. And then um, the results actually further revealed the, the poor conditions for the entry experience, um, the amount of barriers such as these uh, retaining walls and bollards um, that's preventing the park from welcoming these potential users, um, especially for the socially vulnerable group. Um, so my framework um, is titled Breaking Barriers, um, which focuses on activating the, edge of the uh, edges of the park that provides an experience that became the beginning of the park experience. So I've imagined um, these three distinct uh, park edge experiences based on context from both inside and outside the park. Um, the neighborhood edge, um, trying to go uh, clockwise or counterclockwise here, the neighborhood edge uh, would focus on enhancing the already intimate relationship between the park and the neighborhood um, with better public space that are convenient for the daily usage. And then the wilderness edge, um, which is here, um, contains the largest amount of forested areas on the site um, that are already loved by both the visitors and the neighboring residents. So its focus would be on providing um, a balanced vehicular and pedestrian traffic and then provide an equal um, uh, park experience to both the visitors to the park and then the neighborhood residents. Um, the edges on the eastern um, sides became uh, my focus areas um, and then, uh, sorry that my images are upset down, but the activities edge, which is here in the northern side, um, here in my sections, um, is full of geological features and the programming of the site already. So the focus is to review and maximize those features to provide the most dynamic entry experience through topographic interventions. Um, and then lastly, the green edge, which is here, um, is a linear green buffer that is a site to a number of his, 
uh, heritage trees and it has the best view into the rolling hills of the golf course into the park. So then the focus would be um, to find the right balance to blend that experience of being on the edge of the bustling urban conditions and then uh, experience of escaping into the country park um, away from the city. Um, by establishing a diverse spatial experience, allowing views both uh, to the inside and outside of the park. Um, so my framework of uh, breaking barriers um, that establishes the relationship between the park and the adjacent communities operates in these three progressional um, strategies that actually assimilate to uh, establishing person-to-person uh, -person relationships. And through um, breaking the physical barrier to the site and then provide that open entry experience um, it, uh, establishes that first gesture of invitation and welcoming. And this could be done through topographic interventions and then again, capitalizing and revealing on the geological um, features of the site. Um, and then by breaking social barriers and then provide spatial opportunities for uh, participation in the public realm. Um, the uh, social gathering opportunities will help maximize encounterings, foster interactions, sparkle conversations that starts that process of exchange and understanding. And then so to translate into the framework, it could be done through establishing uh, rich spatial um, hierarchies through materiality and then again, topographic interventions. And then lastly, breaking the psychological barrier um, that leads to an embracement and accepting uh, through the establishment of reciprocity, which operates by providing context specific and culturally sensitive programmatic and materialistic conditions to provide that level of exchange and deeper connection between a park and then across um, the different neighborhoods. So I started my um, focus area of the two um, eastern edges with a broad gestural design proposals and then we'll move on um, eventually to my uh, site design here. Um, so this is an overview of um, what I imagine would be the stick and the edge experience that includes moments of transverse uh, traversing between um, the inside and outside the park. Uh, these darker uh, gray lines you see here are where the boundaries are broken that would allow this open view um, from both sides. And then again, I'm capitalizing on the site features that would reveal these topographic interests. And then as a result, the activated um, edges would provide these additional programmable spaces for the neighborhoods. And so we'll zoom in a little bit more um, on two um, instances on this uh, broader design strategy. So on the activities edge, um, so one experience would be to uh, adapt that old Bearden, um, historical Bearden into a more intimate scale uh, arts and performance stage that celebrates the art and culture of the Roxbury neighborhoods. And then the legendary figure of Alma Lewis, who um, some of us have mentioned, um, made a huge contribution um, to the art scene of that community. And then so this section um, begins to show that activated um, scene of that space, um, along with this higher point view out to that specific neighborhood. And then that entry experience could also include an additional ramp up along the drumlin stones um, that are existing on site. Um, some of the other moments along the edges include uh, the Seaver Street terraces, which opens up basically this entire section of the edge. And then the topography will allow the stepping down terracing experience into the park. Um, and then lastly, the Seaver Street Plaza spaces, as well as the Drumlin um, nature play areas are adaptive views on those geological features on the site. And then we'll take another look at uh, breaking barriers at this new entrance of the zoo. So the bigger actions here are um, one to restore Olmsted's um, old plan for this big promenade and then to open up that connection to the uh, to public access. Um, the current condition is that the zoo is completely closed off with um, one big entry um, at uh, both the north and south. 
Um, so the topography here uh, would actually uh, review that this opportunity where um, the site actually slopes down into the zoo, but then um, comes up at the corner here with these drumlin features um, at a higher point. So this flat um, little area allows for a more intimate um, uh, view out opportunity that um, basically pedestrians can simply slide into and then come up to access this high point for the view. Um, so this section began to show how that restored uh, promenade space um, would look like, um, which uh, makes a connection with this new entry um, through the topographic change. And so through those ideas and to maintain the continuity of the edge experience, we're moving on to uh, my site design. Um, so this area sits at the beginning of the green edge, which we can see um, is right south of the zoo here. Um, so this area of the park borders uh, Blue Hill Avenue, uh, which is a bustling commercial street in the Dorchester neighborhood. Um, the existing condition of the site includes um, the golf course, uh, golf course clubhouse, um, which I'm maintain, uh, retaining here. And then these two uh, parking lots, which I propose to remove and have them buried underground since the topography will allow um, to accommodate that to happen. Um, so my site proposal, um, I provide a continued connection um, uh, with Olmsted's grading promenade that leads to this green lawn, which has uh, this section of the edge completely now opened up um, without the currently existing retaining walls. Um, the lawn would help uh, receive the spillover traffic from the zoo, as well as from the nearby uh, school communities. Um, the Blue Hill Avenue terraces are my biggest uh, site interventions. Um, that transforms the existing retaining walls and topographic ridge, basically this area, into a series of stepping and then sitting terraces that starts that interaction um, with both the park and the bustling urban life. Um, the terraces would then reach into the park and then provide, again, a series of seating opportunities um, at different um, height levels with an introspective view into the rolling hills of the golf course, um, as well as the inner uh, circuit loop and to the clubhouse. Um, and I, in the middle here, I propose a new entry which cuts into um, these terraces and then becomes uh, become an ADA accessible path that directly leads into uh, the inside of the park. And then lastly, I propose to um, cut this um, corner section of the ridge and then make it a wide open um, entry experience. Um, and then we kind of take a step back and look, uh, take another look to see how these three steps strategies implement at the site level. Um, for imitation, um, the idea is um, again to provide a clearly defined and accessible entry experience that simultaneously offers the view and prospect into the urban life. And participation um, is encouraged through the strips of terrace, the terraces as well as uh, plant materials within the park that begin to frame a spatial hierarchy that um, would offer a diverse range of gather opportunities to happen. And then uh, for reciprocity, um, I am proposing uh, planting new tree canopies that begin to highlight the process of plant succession in the deliberate way. Um, Dorchester neighborhood, which uh, borders um, my site intervention, is uh, a neighborhood uh, that's known to be the most diverse neighborhood that in basically the last hundred years has gone through multiple waves of um, immigrants coming from um, all over the place, including Eastern Europe, Asian countries, um, Caribbean islands, etc. So throughout the time, um, some residents moved away and some uh, came to settle um, and call this new neighborhood their home. So this mixture of um, established tree species and the new plant life um, echoes that ever-changing and evolving immigrant culture of Dorchester, while also bringing new life and hope to this historical park landscape.
so here is a plan, very light, uh, a plan of my uh, grading proposal as well as uh, circulation proposal. So um, I'm so sorry, again, the line work is not best suited for view on the screen. Um, the overall gesture of the grading is generally in line with the existing conditions uh, where the grounds uh, uh, gradually would come up um, the hill from here and then building up to the higher areas here. And then uh, these cross sections will begin to show um, the spatial relationships, as well as um, areas where um, the three step strategies of imitation, participation, and reciprocity are likely to take place. Um, so I'll just highlight a few things in here. Um, the northern section, um, which cuts from here, uh, northern section of the terraces, uh, since it's at the high point, so it contains the most steps of terraces, that would lead you into this expansive uh, field of larger gathering uh, opportunities. Um, and then in this section here, um, cutting through that new entry, um, the planting of these new species would most likely be um, lining this newly proposed path. So throughout the way, you'll experience this ecological as well as cultural landscape as you ascend into the park. Um, and then I'm also uh, proposing to provide a continuous uh, tree-lined sidewalks and activate the median space as, of, as well that are currently underutilized to complete that entire experience of um, entering, uh, crossing from the neighborhood into the park. Um, so here, this section uh, began to take a closer look um, closer to the existing uh, clubhouse. So um, through these framed um, opportunities for gathering and then the view into the clubhouse, which are already existing. Um, we're likely to see a growing number of um, programming and venues and community led events that, that would happen in here. Um, which is also another aspect of reciprocity that takes that community um, and bring it into the park life uh, while the community is also being served the other way. And then lastly, uh, the southern section is the most uh, narrow areas. So you actually get a closer sense of this um, idea of the prospect and refuge that elevates both the urban experience and then experience um, with, uh, with the park itself, um, with that idea of exchange and then to, to see and to be seen. And then, um, the scales of the uh, terraced benches would vary slightly to give a range of different options to utilize them. Um, the street facing uh, terraces um, is set at a slightly more compacted scale at about six feet and then a periodic 12 feet wide um, landing, while the park facing ones um, would be a little bit more wider at eight feet and 15 feet for more um, immersive experience within the park. And then so the terraces could either be uh, stacked or um, a single or stacked, obviously. And then um, in the lower levels, they can start to break to allow for flexibility of use, which you can kind of see from my planning here. And um, lastly, I just wanted to zoom in on uh, one moment of each of the three strategies. So this is a view of um, imitation at the Northern Terrace um, with the uh, break opportunities I was mentioning in the lower terracing bench that would leave uh, room and flexibility for the disabled group. And then uh, through uh, Transforming the threshold of the park, allowing um, entries to happen, the edge itself actually becomes the beginning of the park experience that would potentially lead to more active use and exploration. Um, this is a moment of uh, participation. Um, what I wanted to highlight is the increased surveillance um, as the edges are now activated um, from the neighborhood communities that would 
uh, inspire a safer park conditions um, to allow the space to become um, a daily routine engagement for uh, residents in the communities. And then lastly, um, the moment of reciprocity, um, which shows that experience of walking through this newly set up edge, uh, set up path, and then um, what you're likely to see with the mixed plant life. Um, so I'm thinking the action of planting and caring for these new species can become a community-led engagement um, that further establishes a level of responsibility and trust between the community and the park. And then um, once again, that walk through the new landscape, um, which is mixed with the establishing habitat and the new plant life um, is a portrait of the neighborhood's immigrant culture that is already closely bounded with the park life itself. Um, so as the park takes on the new landscape, uh, prospecting into um, its future roles as this revitalized crown jewel of emerald necklace, that relationship and the close bound would remain and always um, live with the residents themselves. And then lastly, lastly, um, it's, this is a perspective view of um, a study rather that began to examine the new Blue Hill Avenue uh, path entry condition and how it could potentially interact with the uh, passing potential park users as well as the terraces. Um, so with that, that's the end of my presentation and I welcome any feedback and I just uh, scroll back to um, a plan uh, maybe with this one I'll just pause here for now So I can jump in um, and there was a lot there. <laughs> so I think um, yes. we're probably all, all, all digesting everything we saw. I think that's um, what I figured. <laughs> maybe, a, I, I think um, you, you did a lot of work and a lot of thinking about it, but um, sometimes there is, it is helpful to edit too. So there's probably, um, probably some pieces you could have tightened up too and still, still told For the story. Sure. Yeah, um, but I think, you know, I'll just, I'll just touch on a few things that I liked and defer some of the kind of um, uh, more landscape detail elements to my, um, the rest of the jury here too. But I think, um, you know, I, I really appreciated that you started with the user um, and you started with that perspective and kind of got down mm -hmm. to the scale of um, individual need, thinking about the different types of users and how they're uh, their needs might be different, not just at sort of a demographic level, but also at a mm -hmm. um, personal and programmatic level. And so I thought, I thought that that was a really nice place to start. Um, I was glad to see too that you, as you were talking about the the edges, I think your your kind of analysis was very convincing around the different um, edge conditions of the kind of the four types. Um, and glad to see that you kind of we're not afraid to jump into the street um, and engage that a little bit more in some of um, in some of what you did as you got down in, in greater detail on working out um, mm -hmm. how the park would meet the street because I think that's um, it's a complicated area because you start to get into you know different types of ownership um, but I think that's one of the real challenges that Franklin has is that it just sort of it has right. these edges and it doesn't resolve um, that the zoo is there and so that's a different user, you know, it just sort of lets that go or that you get mm -hmm. to the street and a bus stop that then says this is complicated and so we just sort of wall off. Um, and I think that's what causes a lot of the, in, you know, the barriers that you're suggesting. So I think kind of mm. moving past that was good. Um, let's see. I think there's something to you know, a bunch of people have taken away the parking in this area and buried it underground. And that's probably, um, I know we mentioned at the beginning that was um, sort of an making something difficult go away. And I think it is really it's true. fair to say that that's, um, you know, you were talking about kind of removing barriers and making things more legible. And there's a degree to which that would work against you in that case. I think um, this project might want to take on kind of 
visibility from the wayfinding standpoint too. And just when people arrive, how do they have a mm. clear sense of arrival and where they where they want to go um, within such a large park? And I think some moves like that would erode the legibility of, you know, where where do I arrive safely and then um, kind of branch out into the bigger park. Um, so just think about each of those. I think there is, um, you had one sort of towards towards the end, one of your um, your renderings that were uh, uh, kind of rendered edge of the, um, the street where it was a terrace it was kind of a nice look at like this, the urban street coming into, into the park. And so I started to imagine how that might be a place to solve some of the, um, the issues of like, where do bathrooms go and, where do those moments of orientation happen, which right now are kind of deeper into the park where you're already sort of lost. Um, so this right. as sort of a solution to pack in some of that program could be nice. Okay. Uh, Phoebe, um, uh, forgive me for not remembering every slide, um, but did you have a very clear diagram that indicates for us uh, where people can enter along this side and how? Um, you're talking about along this edge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, this so, design. so maybe uh, I think the uh, this I don't know if this might be a little bit more clear, but um, essentially the existing condition is that this is all kind of lined with retaining walls. And then there's like very little space for accessing to begin with. But um, I guess my innovation, the big idea behind it is really to open up this entire edge. So then this long area, uh, so basically all the, the retaining wall in this area would be completely taken away. So this becomes like a completely uh, open entry that also meets this um, destination points of the zoo entry. And then, um, and then all these terraces essentially became um, open entries for, you know, it's almost like a plaza where you kind of just like step up and then you can um, directly step up from the higher level of the terrace into the park. And then um, I guess my uh, newly proposed entry would be this ADA accessible um, uh, mm -hmm. ramp that would start at the street level and then um, directly just uh, cuts, uh, cuts these terraces and directly come up to the park. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, it seems like you have opened this up quite a bit um, compared with the existing condition. Um, even yes. though I lived in Boston for many, <laughs> many years, I don't know Franklin Park very well, um, which is probably telling. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I think, um, so, so my comments are going to be really about this terracing strategy and, and what the experience of the street is in a kind of detailed design way. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that, I think you're close but I think that um, you missed the mark a little bit. Um, and, and mainly because the terraces um, are pretty repetitive um, as you move down the street. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it is a, it's a stepped landscape, right? Mm -hmm. For the most part um, along this edge. Um, and I wonder if instead of having one just one access point that is ADA accessible. If you couldn't, um, if you couldn't massage the the physical design to make it possible to to sort of to, to make it much more porous for people of all abilities, so that instead uh -huh. of these repetitive steps, right ac across these edges, that they begin to slip apart. Um, there's much more sort of ramping incorporated in and amongst mm -hmm. them um, so mm -hmm. that they're, they're less like steps and more like scissors. Um, okay. Because I, I think that, um, you know, I also think formally that would be a more uh, playful and exciting language um, that could happen at this edge. Um, and, 
you know, the, the thing I really like about it is where I see these things starting to, to pull away and curve around um, and, and your language or your, your tactic actually beca becomes um, a much broader gesture. Um, <clears throat> you know, where, where I think it begins to weaken is if we see these as isolated pieces, the steps, mm. um, the, the sort of ramp, the pathways, the entry, right? Even, even giving them different colors, it tells me that you're not thinking about this in a kind of with a consistent language or um, like where there's real continuity um, across the design. It's more sort of like placing objects in the park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that for me also those sections um, and perspectives read that way. You know, we see the sloping of the land, that's one thing. And then we see these stairs and that's another thing. Um, instead of kind of understanding topography more holistically, um, and the, you know, whether it is the, the land is sort of shaped, mm -hmm. um, you know, the land can be shaped as opposed to having retention and objects placed in it. Um, right. So I guess I'm just looking for, like, I see a great opportunity in a, in a complication of your design um, and a kind of more um, dynamic integration of the land and um, these kind of hard uh, retaining elements. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I guess my, um, like the way that how these things start to curve and the whole kind of design language was, I was really trying my best to, I guess, conform with the existing um, topography, which like I see in that overall gesture of, you know, this is like a flatter area that could come up here. And then, so I essentially like I was, my hope is that my design doesn't read as the objects in space, but rather like something that kind of just builds into um, what's already existing there. But I do agree though, like when I look at um, some of the these sections, I there, I, I think it could be, especially along the street edges, it could be, you know, something to kind of take a, a, a stronger or aggressive stance to not to make it object like. Yeah, so, yeah and I, I appreciate that. I also that. think if if your if your scheme is called breaking barriers, but you've created a barrier all along this edge except for one access point. You know, for people who can't can't traverse a 18 inch riser, um, you know, then <laughs> then maybe it deserves another look. That's true. Yeah. And, and I and I think it's I think it's actually really possible um, to achieve. Yeah, I think one of the things I came to realize also this is something I discussed with um, Gina sometime along the way that like when I start to get into and seeing like how long like. I'm marking this five minutes walking distance. This is like a very long edge um, of terraces. Um, so I guess what I was trying to do is to propose these little uh, breaks. Um, and then also like these lower areas would obviously be uh, like have fewer steps. And then it you would see this like, I wish I have a better like long longitudinal section that I might be able to study this condition better. You know, but, you know, Phoebe, you, um, you, you, you started this, this exploration with something that was very small scale mm -hmm. and object focused. Phoebe mm -hmm, uh, Liquar, mm -hmm. when we started, Phoebe was really looking at like the grain of the paving and the kinds of ways the gateways operated as a series of objects. And so moving from that into a reading of the whole edge as a unified landscape, that has moments of porosity and moments of occupation it was like a huge leap forward, but I totally agree. If you, if we kept going at this, I think you would integrate um, ADA through these terraces. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's just been this kind of constant evolution away from thinking about it as objects in the landscape and instead spaces that you're, so we're trying to get into language, like how do you carve an entrance in? How do you, you know, expand yeah. the sense of arrival? Yeah, and I mean, just formally too, I mm -hmm. think where it, you know, looking at these diagrams that are up on the screen right now, 
the the sort of the the pieces that have um, uh, some uh, like a dynamic quality to them are so much more exciting. And I also think mm -hmm. like socially, they're much more mm -hmm. exciting um, in the kinds of uh, the ways that they um, position people, um, the way that they can splay apart um, to accommodate planting um, or, um, or, you know, capture water. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, mm -hmm. I just, uh, I, I wish that that was a language that, um, that, that was found throughout, um, you know, and it, and it wasn't sort of these pieces are splaying off and, and sort of have it having this sort of dynamic form. And then at the street, we just have parallel, you know, regular terraces. Mm -hmm. um, a I, great presentation though, like really wonderful the way you walked you. us through. And, um, and for you, I think it was really concise. <laughs> So for great. me in particular, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you did a great job on that. Kristen, you're going to offer something. Sorry. No, that's okay. I can be. I can be quick. Um, I, I I agree with um, both of these comments. I was thinking the same thing myself. It's important when you are making interventions to to kind of test how much is enough. And um, well, let me back up. First of all, I think there's just so much work here. It's sort of mind numbing and boggling and amazing. Mm -hmm. And really, so congratulations on, and it's not just busy work, you know, there's thought in all of it and the drawings are beautiful. Um, uh, I, um, I think, um, can we go back to like the, um, actually the Seaver Street sections? Um, yes. Yeah, I just because one yeah That's any fine. either any of these so i think okay. the 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 recognition that um the edges at franklin park are largely really problematic and to decide that they're an opportunity is just a fantastic place to start um i had trouble understanding the project um in terms of what you're really doing versus what you're touching versus what you're not touching and looking in mm. plan versus section. And I think um, based on what I understand, it's kind of like sometimes you touch too much and sometimes you're touching too little. Um, and one of the things I would say, since you are clearly like super duper duper facile in making drawings is that the drawings, you know, a lot of times in school, you feel like drawings are all about um, presenting an idea at these milestones, but really the drawings are most important for the information they're giving you back about what you're doing or not doing and whether it's good or not in you know in your own terms and i think what is hard in the drawings the way you you've done them here is it's almost impossible to see what is new and what is an intervention because it just looks ex kind of exactly the way it looks now and um i think you would maybe would have been helpful for me and maybe for you too to you know kind of maybe colorize the bit that is yours and make mm -hmm. the bit that is um uh existing grayscale and then you might be able to see a little bit better about you know what your intervention really is is it strong enough is it legible is it is it sculpted into the rock is it you know a landform that you are manipulating um, so that, and that's a little bit the way I felt, um, in the, in the, um, in the project that you focused on, um, it was hard to see whether what you were showing is exactly what's happening, um, because there's a lot of mature canopy that you're showing, but you're doing a lot of grading and this is really detailed because you have a project that I can pick on in this way, but, um, I think you have to make sure that the drawing accurately reflects the impacts of your project and therefore you get that information back about whether you're doing something that you believe in still or not. And that section that you talk about or the section perspective where you see just sort of this relentless edge of similarly scaled steps, 
is one of those moments where you get feedback about maybe I have too much of this. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think I would love to have seen is, well, I agree about the removal of the parking. Um, if I'm a golf, this is again, picky, but if I'm a golfer and I come here with my golf, where, where am I going? You know, so this is a little bit about being tough on yourself with when you take something away, how is it solved or what are the impacts of adding or taking away? But the other thing is that this is one of the most beautiful moments in the park is where you, if you like make it through the park, the parking lot without getting killed, this moment where you start to see the city above you and this drumlin to your, you know, right in this place. And then you're kind of descending through this valley is an incredibly beautiful moment. So I think the fact that you've cited your project there is really smart and beautiful, but it makes it even more critical to know what you're changing and what you're keeping because it is such a beautiful mm -hmm. place already. So mm -hmm. I think I would just advocate for you to not try to eye wash the project, um, but in its development, understand um, what you're what you're really changing. So you know whether you, you could do less of it and have the project that you're talking about and maybe mm -hmm. leave a little bit more of the beauty that's there because I know it's something that you're um, you're looking at um, carefully. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. Nicely done. Thank I do you. think Thanks, I do think I do think your presentation skills are um, visually it was outstanding and I think the language you used was wonderful too. I think Bree's right and and Phoebe's right and maybe Kristen said it too just continue to work on this your whole career tightening it up saying what needs to be said letting the drawings speak more because um, you have a you have a very fluent audience and reading drawings and so you don't have to describe everything in fact it's nice to have a little imagination and breath in presentation but it was it was really remarkably beautiful so thanks Phoebe. Thank you thank you everyone for the feedback it's really helpful. Thank you Phoebe. Um, Danielle are yeah. you ready? Hello everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I don't know if y'all can see this, but I'm going to try to. Um, do you know how did you say to kind of move everyone to like a corner because I could kind of see everyone? Oh, up in the upper right hand corner, there's a couple different view options. I think. Oh, I see it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yep. All right. Perfect. So um, my name is Danielle, um, and my project is centered around the idea or the general premise of reimagining Franklin Park through the lens of circulation. And what I kind of imagine that meaning is both using the already existing circulation of Franklin Park, as well as adding these new um, connective paths to highlight the already existing features within Franklin Park. Um, and just utilizing that as a way to kind of give people a new and like new experience of a new way to experience the park is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so like my partner Phoebe um, already kind of mentioned in our first early phases, we did a lot of um, analysis about um, both at the neighborhood scale as well as like at a larger statewide scale. But one thing we really noticed and a lot of people have already touched on this is the lack of connectivity between the east and the west sides. And um, as you can see in, um, in the drawing, that really thin red line is just the only and predominant um, means of vehicular movement through the park and that circuit drive, as well as um, a bus path as well. But along that drive, there really is a very inconsistent um, means of moving through for pedestrians as well as cyclists. In some places it's consistent, in some places it breaks off. And we, when we went there, we would see these cow paths that would be forged by people to kind of create their own way of moving through. Um, and so that was one major thing that I wanted to kind of highlight moving into the framework. Um, another thing that we've already touched on as well is that really um, stark amount of socioeconomic disparity that exists within the neighborhoods. And right now, um, Franklin Park stands as this divider as opposed to this shared middle space where all these people could, of different socioeconomic backgrounds and races and they could just kind of come in and experience the space in which everyone is equal. And so that was a huge um, thing that I noticed that I wanted to take into my project. Um, and so kind of synthesizing those key observations into three comprehensive goal, 
all with the general um, goal of equity and creating a space for everyone. I divided those three using those diagrams to kind of show the goal of connection, to kind of re-engage those surrounding neighborhoods, especially the ones on the east side, and to kind of give them a reason to kind of come back into the park and um, experience it in a new way. And then the second goal being attract, and I imagine that being more in the sense of programmatic transformation, which um, the, the first two goals I'm, I didn't really go into because the majority of my project is based within porosity, but the idea behind the, the three goals would be that somehow people would be brought back into the park and then using porosity and using circulation as a means to kind of disseminate them and allow them to explore and experience the already existing features, which people I feel like are not um, utilizing in the way that they really could. Um, and so, like I mentioned, the bulk of my work is within porosity. And just to sum that idea up, it's just transforming um, circuit drive into this space that is not that this um, road, that's not this uh, barrier, but now it's a boundary that does allow porosity and movement across. Um, and so I just did that in three ways, um, trying to start at selection and analysis, which just meant picking points along circuit drive that I felt had the greatest amount of potential to allow people to kind of move across. And then second, and I'm gonna go into that in the next few phases, but the second one was to then improve those access points in order to reprioritize the pedestrian and cyclist experiences so that people actually feel welcome and safe at those access points and also safe enough to kind of move through. And then the third one would be to utilize views, connected paths and tree canopy to attract visitors and to allow people to really enjoy their experience while they're there. Um, and so like I mentioned, the first step was uh, to pick those access points. And what that just looked like was doing a walk through Circuit Drive, um, kind of characterizing the, um, the different spaces through these three criteria that Phoebe and I came up with, which to sum them up, it's just degree of invitation. So what are the views surrounding there? Um, what's, what are the means of wayfinding? And then on the second um, one, it would be level of con connectivity. So what are the other connective paths that already exist um, and how could we utilize those? And then lastly, it would be potential for engagement, which was the main one because um, that involved me looking at the surrounding context, the surrounding features. Are there any um, significant like historical places and landmarks along the drive? And so doing that, I'm just showing a little bit of a snapshot of what that analysis looked like. But what it really was, was a lot of sections and a lot of um, deep diving into what that experience looked like. But doing all of that led me to Ellicott Arch, which is going to be the point where um, I'm going to try to see how I could basically use this example and the improvement of this access point as a, um, a means to kind of prescribe a way for the other access points to be improved as well. Um, and so this is just showing the analysis I did at first in the early semester, just showing what that drive looks like. Currently, the arch is, um, just for a little bit of history, it was built by, it was designed by John Olmsted, who was, I believe, the Olmsted's um, stepson. And he just designed it as, you know, this causeway just to kind of connect um, to circuit drive because of the gremlins and the unevenness of the site. And then also still allow um, foot traffic to go underneath. Um, and then uh, Olmsted himself used that idea as also a way to allow people to move from the wilderness, which is on the left side, to now transition into the meadow and the golf course space. So those are two contrasting different experiences, but using the arch as this way to move through. So, um, yeah, so what that just looked like in terms of zooming out and looking at what exactly um, I, I had to work with in terms of what was the programs around there were the connective paths. Um, I just decided um, in order to really utilize Ellicott Arch as this space that hopefully pedestrians and cyclists could use, I decided to mirror, just simply mirror the geometry at that segment of Circuit Drive. And you can see that in the dashed um, red line and just allow that experience to now be solely for pedestrians and cyclists and now the, uh, divert the traffic and pedestrian traffic and bus traffic to go around it. So right now, as you see that space, it's just gonna be the arch itself and restoring that to be um, no longer impervious cover, but just to be a whole part of the um, park experience. Um, so yeah, once I decided I wanted to kind of restore Ellicott Arch, I started thinking about the implications of geometric changes. So just imagining that arch 
no longer being for cars, I'm imagining as almost like this blank slate, what do I imagine the geometry for circulation to be, both for pedestrians and cyclists? So exploring the implications of a parallel means of movement and where um, activity would occur and, um, on the arch, as well as safety. Safety was a big one because um, we started thinking about how the cyclists would want some, a different experience than the pedestrians and thinking about how that could um, happen at points of intersection. And then lastly, it took me to exploring the selectively intertwined means of um, organizing the circulation. Um, and some of them were a little bit too, I guess, prescribed and too tight knit in terms of the one in the middle, the third one. And then I kind of did an exploration where it was almost this really kind of wild and imagining as the space where it's almost not really prescribed and people could just kind of walk along the grass and do whatever they wanted to do. But I think I had to try to find a middle ground, which led me to the last iteration. And that was the one I used moving forward to design the arch. Um, and so just doing a couple of sketches, I started to think about um, where what I wanted to happen at each of these different spaces that are now created by the intersection of these two loops. Um, and I just realized that I wanted um, a variety of different experiences, but the main experience and the main destination would be turning Ellicott Arch into this really alive and blooming garden. And I'm calling it the immersive garden. Um, and so in, within that space, it's almost just like uh, a space that's created, but then all the circulations happening around it. So it almost invites you to kind of want to move in and experience it and um, walk through it. But then also th that also raised the, the questions about what happens when the two means of moving through intersect. Um, so I decided I wanted those spaces of intersection to be programmed as well. And then also uh, another important thing to note was I wanted to also create a means for people to move up from below. Um, so when they're in the park itself, how to come up to the arch. And so that led to my design for Ellicott Arch, which just meant removing all the impervious cover and turning that from the um, vehicular space and this high speed road into just being an extension of the park. And then having that immersive garden, also having designated spaces for bike racks, because as it exists right now, the only places for cyclists to kind of stop and really experience the space is at the clubhouse. Um, and so I decided to add some there so that even while cyclists are moving through the arch, they might be enticed to stop and park their bike and kind of move through. And also the experience for pedestrians while coming up the stairs, they might have a space to sit as well and enjoy the views um, was also a huge part. Um, and just so for a side-by-side -side comparison of what that looks like, transforming it from that road into now being this really alive and blooming um, bridge. Um, and then just a sectional idea of what that looks like, transforming that from those vehicular spaces and a really loud space as well to now being this more peaceful um, space where people could bring their children and actually in, uh, engage with the pudding stone and just experience it in a new way. Um, and then I started to dive into some body scale analyses, um, thinking about how the scale of planting and seeding and stairs might influence human interaction. So how could someone that's coming up the stairs, for example, how would they react um, in terms of the, how would they kind of experience their surroundings when the staircase is a certain way? Um, so I started thinking about how if the stairs were really steep, how that could um, encourage this tunnel vision where you're almost in, uncomfortable and you wanna kind of quickly get up, it gives you this tunnel vision to get to your destination or this really more conventional and aware way of stepping that would just get you to the arch and you don't really kind of ex experience anything new. But then the one I kind of uh, felt most drawn to would be this really shallow way of um, moving up the arch where it's these slates of pudding stone that are about two inches thin, thin um, and that will allow you to have a scenic contemplative way of moving up. Um, and then in terms of the planting itself in that immersive garden, I also started to think about what would be the role of the heights of the planting and growing flowers that would kind of make someone maybe be disoriented because it's so, um, you're kind of buried in it, but then also what would be the role of it just being this really shallow uh, area of planting and how that might just make you kind of want to walk through and enjoy the views. And then lastly would be, um, thinking about the edge condition at the arch. And I started thinking about the role of the scale, how people might lean on the, the edge and also accommodating three different users, the person that might be sitting on the edge of that immersive garden, the person that might just be walking through and then the last person that might just be um, stopping to view. Um, so there is actually a slide missing here. 
I'm so sorry about this. Um, do you mind if I just really quick uh, see if I can pull that up? I, I don't know if that's okay. It's pretty important. And I might just- uh, you, are, you are coming up against your time, Danielle, so yes, just as long I'm, as it's I'm the really, last thing. I'm really sorry about this. I'm really that's sorry okay. about this. Um, <clears throat> but this is a relatively important one to just really quick show. But basically what that looked like was um, using the arch as now this immersive space in the middle, but also still allowing access and ways to move through that were for pedestrians and for cyclists. And then in terms of the longitudinal section, just to allow, just to show those different experiences um, in the longitudinal direction where the, the edges are just ex extensions of the regular park, but then where you get to that immersive garden is where you have a very different experience and can actually enjoy the views. Um, so yeah, these are just my last two slides. Um, but I just wanted to also show that I did some consideration in terms of what the planting would actually look like and doing some research about nature planning in uh, Boston and seeing, looking for these really versatile plants that could be grown um, seasonally, finding some evergreen ones and some fall foliage and some that would bloom in the, the summer. But just imagining also that space just really coming alive at all times. Um, that's the goal but also allowing it to be a destination as well. Um, and then lastly, this would just be some experiential vignettes that I did initially just to show the different experiences of someone that might be walking and approaching the arch and looking up and seeing this kind of blooming new experience versus a cyclist versus a pedestrian um, walking through the park. So yeah, that's it. Sorry for going over time. And I can go back a little bit to this one. Okay, I'll try to jump in. Um, wh where does the um, where does where does Circuit Drive go if it doesn't go here? So I tried to kind of show that in this site plan, but let me let me just go back a couple slides. This one. Um, but all that just looks like is a mirroring of that existing geometry and it just continues to connect on either side. So all that does is just carve out the arch to the left side. I think there, you know, there's a ton of work here and a ton of thought. I'm having a hard time understanding the project um, and why you would do it. Um, as an enhancement of the park. Um, you know, there's a kind of, um, I don't know, maybe high line is not exactly the right word, but there's a sort of, you know, linear park over structure and over under relationship. Um, but the difference is, you know, we're, you know, 525 acres of open space. And so the, the, the need for um, the adjustment to circuit drive in order to um, to give people an experience of a garden as beautiful as it looks like it would be is something I'm not yet convinced by um, in in the presentation. And I think I was also a little surprised that because you you had like really great analysis in the beginning. Um, and um, you know, one of the things that you seemed most concerned about was the divide along that eastern edge and the way that that community might be better served by the park. But then the project was cited about as far west as it could get. Um, so I don't know if there is uh, there, if there was a reason for that, or if sometimes maybe it's just one of those things that happens where you put your analysis in your presentation and that's not what your project is anymore. And then the critic gets pissed off um, because it, the story isn't connected. So that's just a tip for the future. People are gonna listen to you in the beginning and try to take that through line because that's the kind of foundation for your evidence. Um, so, I mean, that having been been said, I think the potential for a project that is trying to link 
spaces that are lower and higher through um, uh, different modes of movement um, and engage historic structure in um, inventive ways is really interesting. I think I'm struggling to talk about this project because it, it, I'm, I don't really understand the citing. Um, I guess um, I did forget to mention in um, when I was talking about this slide, um, because this was kind of following the earlier analysis. The reason why I decided to also start with Alicot Arch was also because of the high amount of connectivity it has to all the neighborhoods. Um, there was a situation where um, Alicot Arch, as it stands right now, you can see in the blue line, which is the bike paths. Right now, th that's one of the only means of circulation that's really heavily kind of like ingrained in other neighborhoods and also allows people to kind of come in there. So I decided to select that and also to retain not just turn the arch into a pedestrian experience, but also to ensure that it also incorporated a cyclist experience because there are designated site paths that, um, bike paths that reach into those disadvantaged neighborhoods and bring them into that arch. So I think that's something that was important to mention. I just uh, didn't say it, but that wasn't uh, the initial reason for citing it there. It was yeah. It does reach into those neighborhoods. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, Phoebe, I'm um, uh, Danielle, I, I think, um, you know, I think um, your whole idea when you started this design project, and we keep coming back to the language you use, because it's really important, was this idea that there were moments where from circuit drive, you could create these more porous connections into the park. So it's, mm -hmm. it's all suggestive of you're moving along one system and it's about inviting you into this other system. And I think just in all the drawings of the, of the bridge and the, um, your design proposition, it's still always reinforcing this, this, the same movement as the circuit mm -hmm. drive. So you're just not, mm -hmm. it's just, again, it's what Kristen's saying. It's like not just connecting the narrative to the design moves in a really mm -hmm. direct way. So I can see why, um, I can see, I can see the critique really clearly. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like I, um, your, your project isn't about circuit drive to me. Mm -hmm. um, your project is about something else. Um, and, you know, I mean, unless you are sort of trying to reinforce circuit drive as this monolithic uh, division in the park, because I was just astounded by that image you showed of the road and that like, there's, there's not even like a sidewalk, like it's so, it's so pedestrian unfriendly and scary um and seemingly sort of high speed um you know and so there's a ton of work to be done there exactly what you presented leading up to to your site design um you know there's there's a real need for people to move across there's a real need for people and and animals and you know to move both across and along Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I would even like question, should it even be there? I'm sure, um, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, it was, it was imposed on the park at a certain point in time. Right. Um, <clears throat> when, when we did those kinds of things um, to bring automobiles um, through large parks. So I, I just think that's not what your project is about because um, you have maintained the hegemony of circuit drive by just moving it to mm -hmm. a different location mm -hmm. and not really addressing that need. So um, I think, you know, in terms of presentation, I don't, I don't know, like it seemed like you sort of shifted to something else, um, the adaptation of, uh, of a historic um, uh, stone work. Um, and, and so, you know, in the context of a studio, I can understand, well, that's difficult. If your project shifts away from your original analysis, then, you know, how do you talk about it? But I think you have to find a way to do that, um, in, in order to, to bring us in and also to understand it for yourself. Um, you know, is it, you know, it, like ultimately what we're going to ask is, is this project a critique of, of automobile circulation within the park and, and how. Um, but I think what you've actually done is 
provide a different way for people to like climb on top of um, something that was, you know, inaccessible to them. Um, maybe to gain a different sense of prospect um, or, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, just a, a sort of completely different relationship um, in terms of elevation to the park. Um, yeah. I think there's sort of a, a common um, thread between uh, all the projects that kind of tackle cars in one way or another, which is that cars and parks are bad. Um, and I don't know if that's um, totally a solution because they do serve a purpose and you know we, we need to get people places and create kind of activity in different places and um, and so maybe what, you know, Phoebe was getting at was sort of the, the character issues, which are huge, and the fact that um, there is no, it's, there, you know, there is no blurring of, um, of kind of who that road belongs to. It belongs to buses mm -hmm. and cars, you know, and so, and people just sort of exist at the edge of it. So I think there's a lot that could be done to the experience of Circuit Drive and slowing things down and making, making it a great way to navigate the park, but I, I think your your um, your presentation actually did me, make me think a couple of things about it, which I think the idea of kind of a bypass around a sensitive historic moment that could be much more used and integrated into um, into the experience of kind of the historic nature of the park is kind of nice. That maybe. Maybe if we take the cars are bad to a degree, you know, there's a reason to get them away from that site. Um, and it's, it's not a huge move that, that is required. Um, but it made me think if that's the idea, is that the right place for it? Is that the only place? And what mm -hmm. about like Scarborough Pond, um, which is kind of a sensitive ecological area, um, sort of a little bit, um, I would say less talked about in all of these presentations and also so far in you know our community feedback and the master planning process, but circuit drive goes over that too. Mm -hmm. um, so would it be a chance to say more holistically, circuit drive has an important role to move vehicles through the park, but it it shouldn't impede the historic landscape, it shouldn't impede mm -hmm. the ecology. And so we have to reroute it um, a little bit more um, comprehensively. And then I think you could mm -hmm. really kind of defend and sort of exploit, you know, what you can do with those landscapes um, environmentally and then, you know, with the historic arch as well. So maybe it's taking that idea a little bit further. Right, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And I think just a little bit to touch on that as well, I did get the critique at some point that why not just remove circuit drive entirely and kind of make that park experience just holistically mm -hmm. pedestrian and cyclist. But I think one of, re one of the reasons I decided to keep it was also, my premise being that the idea is to kind of invite and pull people into those spaces. And if I was maybe in the bus and moving through my daily route to work and seeing that, oh, yeah, there's actually a place for pedestrians to kind of experience, then um, they might invite more potential park goers. So, but I, yeah. I think that's, that is pretty valid that it, it, just moving it also just doesn't take it away and it doesn't support that circuit drive is bad. But, well, yeah, and you know, I, I, I'm surprised because I think um, you guys are in Texas. You must know cars are so important, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we, we, it might, I don't think it's an either or that we totally take it away. We have to figure out how to live with it and make it a great part of the experience. There are parks, um, you know, many large parks like this that have, um, have well-designed, gracious roads where people know to slow down and they know they're somewhere right. special. And so I think that's, that could be the, the balance. Um, you did say, I, I, I did want to, this is kind of a detail, but I think on one of your early slides, you talked about removing Shattuck and the golf course um, uh, as one of your kind of like three principles in that, oh, like during yeah, yeah. the program. And I, I do feel like that's kind of tangential to what you're doing. Um, and so you could, you could live with those things if you're going to tackle the road. I see. I see what you're saying. <laughs> yes. No, you don't have to go back. Yeah, it's just really slow. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Laura. Hello.
All right, can everybody see my screen? Great. Um, so this is written stone. This project explores the relationship between ourselves and um, inert materials, how we affect inert materials, but more importantly, how inert materials affect us. Uh, we've covered the Roxbury Pruning Stone a bit. I took a nosedive because I was so inspired by it. Um, and I'm not the only one who's been inspired by walking um, the area. The Roxbury Pruning Stone is found only in the Roxbury neighborhood, which uh, Franklin Park is a part of. And Oliver Wendell in the 1800s wrote, look at that pebble in it, from what cliff was it broken, or what beach will by what waves of what ocean. And then he goes on to notice the scratches on the surface that have survived thousands of years of erosion. Um, so really this amazing artifact of resilience in the landscape. In fact, it is a conglomerate of volcanic ash and stone. So as you're standing in Franklin Park, you are actually standing next to fragments of a volcano. Its origins are from Avalonia, uh, which is a supercontinent that, uh, continent that became part of the supercontinent Pangaea at the nexus of North America, West, Western Europe, and West Africa. Uh, which means that the sister fragments of the Roxbury pudding stones are actually found in these regions, which is very interesting when we look at the anthropogenic movements from the 15th century to today, uh, which mirrors that those regions and the demographics that are currently found around Franklin Park. It is a long history um, that I won't go too much into um, because it, it dwells into um, the Great Migration and White Flight, but basically Worcester and Roxbury used to be um, very diverse, and um, after the 70s and white flight, it led into segregated neighborhoods where Jamaica Plain is uh, more affluent and um, largely a Caucasian, so um, people of Western European descent, and then Rochester and, and Roxbury being uh, predominantly Black and um, socioeconomically more challenged. Um, the historical artifacts in the landscape are Olmsted ruins, which use the Roxbury pudding stone. If we look at the historical timeline of the site from Olmsted to today, we see that the urbanization of the site led to a fragmentation. Um, but I am more interested in the geological timeline that formed that Roxbury pudding stone. So in that way, the boulders and outcrops and erratics are the historical artifacts of the landscape where Roxbury used to be a volcano, um, and then a glacier, and as that glacier retreated, it deposited all that uh, conglomerate and uh, also formed the drumlins that are characteristic of the site. Um, so I started to do some studies on what it means to look at that geology and apply it to human experience. So we can pull some textures from a volcano and how that incites activity, how the movement of rivers and sedimentation um, is a like movement of people and uh, retreat at nodes. <laughs> And then how the uh, movement through drumlins is like movement of people constrained by topography. Um, as far as the framework stage, I um, looked at three aspects of simplifying the circulation. So removing the barrier that is um, circuit drive right now being only for vehicles, but make it for pedestrian bike and bus. Um, and then simplifying the pedestrian experience as well. Um, diversifying the ecology of the site uh, beyond just woodlands and sports ground and then consolidating the active programming towards the zoo and the eastern edge of the site for a more conducive experience. Um, so in the site analysis, I noticed that the Roxbury pudding stone is mostly found in the wilderness, um, which is mostly benefiting the Jamaica, Jamaica Plain neighborhood. Um, again, because of that really strong divide that is circuit drive and also the access points are only found in Jamaica Plain. So the proposal is to introduced three zones, one that highlights the natural geology um, and then um, has more access points to the natural geology, but introduce an engineered geology condition, which is currently missing for most of the site, um, so that every community around Franklin Park has that amazing geological experience. So when I started to think about what, what is engineered geology, I looked at the process of plant succession and what happens after a disturbance, like a massive a volcanic eruption, which happened on the site millions of years ago. Um, and we can really describe this as a process of community building um, where seeds and winds and birds are moving in, changing the earth so that a climax, climax community can survive, which otherwise would not have been able to without this community building. We can think of this section as a section through the site today because we have that woodland again in the wilderness. So then these uh, moments apply to the introduced zones of engineered geology and the hybrid zone in between the two. 
Um, I started to characterize the materials of that plant succession, but more importantly, the textual qualities of the different plant communities. Um, so looking at textual qualities, right now we have two conditions. We have the dense woodlands and we have what I call low homogeneous plantings, but really means golf course. So that is a condition of uh, dense shade on the ground and then low shade and low texture. So the proposal is to introduce a gradient in between through the thinning of canopy to allow dappled light onto that ground and then introduce more textual plantings. Um, also keeping in mind the body experience of what this means and also introduce a gradient of materials um, that will highlight that natural geology that exists, the rocks are putting stone in the wilderness and introduce a material that creates a similar experience but contrasts in color, in texture, um, in feel to create a novel experience um, that also highlights the natural geology. So I chose a, 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 a black coated steel, a yellow coated steel, powder coated steel is what I'm trying to say. Um, so how that, what that looks like on the, in, on the framework is um, opening up views to the Olmsted ruins, again, through the thinning of canopy, introduce some of that contrast in the yellow steel and the natural geology um, the hybrid geology being the in-between conditions, so being mostly about movement and how um, that means that we can start to have moments um, along the path, but also benching with that material as well. And then the engineering geology section where um, right now Scarborough Pond is, um, and we can see there's some texture that exists, but very low contrast. So introducing elements that up the contrast to the plantings and the existing conditions on the site. And we will be welding in closer to the engineer geology section. Um, so this is everything that's happening within the park, um, but a lot is happening outside as well. So um, I thought about the, the, a woman living in Dorchester um, and her experiences on the site, uh, charting out her lifetime from childhood to elder years and how that is a level of transformation. Um, and through her lifetime, the neighborhood of Dorchester is under uh, immense gentrification stress. So her neighborhood is changing, which is a way of, um, we can describe it as erosion, cultural erosion. Um, the architecture, the residential architecture, the local businesses um, are changing, are closing, new ones are moving in, and towards the end of her life, her neighborhood might not look, what, look like what it looked like in her childhood. Um, and that is obviously very stressful. Um, and so within the park, we have two scales of change. One where the ecologies, um, Introducing more successional uh, plant communities brings in more birds and allow communities to build. So a way that change can mean growth and can be a therapeutic um, moment in the park, but also have the inert materials do not change in that anthropogenic scale of um, change, which means that they're resilient, um, they're reliable, and so that can itself be a therapeutic moment as well. So as I mentioned, we are looking more at the engineer geology uh, side, particularly around Scarborough Pond. Um, this is the existing condition, dense woodland, golf course, um, and then this, what used to be circuit drive, the vehicles right now are actually not allowed on this, but it's still a very wide asphalt road. Um, I am introducing these, in, these moments throughout the landscape. Um, one, a new gateway from Dorchester that leads to an amphitheater again with that yellow coated powdered steel, powder coated steel, <laughs> um, with paths that then lead to the pond where curvilinear your path are interrupted by these built bridges um, that actually then activate this node here that is Morton Rock. Right now, Morton Rock is covered in dense woodland and because of that asphalt road with no viewpoint, it is really not highlighted. There's no experience around it. It is a 60 foot high rock, it's beautiful. Um, so I am opening up the views, again, introducing these suspended bridges that allow for community building to happen ecologically, but also allow for this moment of connection to the rock. Um, so I did some studies of what was best for the angle to have that moment with the rock, and this is what I came up with, also keeping in mind uh, topography as well, so this was kind of a massage between the two. Um, I was also in um, inspired by the tectonic plate movement that led to the Roxbury putting stone outcrops in the landscape. So I designed a, a slight faceting to the bridge um, facade um, in contact with that. And then again, this is about 
establishing a view from the bridge to the rock in order to have that moment um, of resilience and being able to visit it uh, reliably always to know that when things are changing in around you or um, are, are happening really fast and that is stressful, you can have that moment of connection and revisit something that you know is going to be there and present and resilient. The second uh, intervention is the amphitheater with the new gateway to Dorchester. Um, it is again, um, with that steel, it is a terracing down towards the meadow. Um, I kept in mind the individual body scale to be for it to be comfortable and not overwhelmingly big, but I really wanted it to be large enough for groups um, to enjoy. And it is about establishing that view um, to the meadow in order to see that change can also bring growth and can bring um, some it can be a beautiful thing sometimes. Um, and this is a cut and fill operation. I made sure to um, be in uh, line with the existing topography. Uh, the amphitheater has arms that branch out like follies into the landscape. And you'll see here that they are dotting the path. And this is where you can really see that materials change human behavior. So we have the same elements along the path jutting against lawn and jutting against meadow, which create a totally different experience. Against lawn, you can have group seating, you can lean against it, um, you can stand on it, it has a very uh, variable usage. But then the same element against meadow has created a more individualistic experience, but also more play where one could stand on this uh, and stand among the wildflowers or even lay down and have the wildflowers over your head. And so this is where um, the woman in Dorchester can visit this um, with the steel being reliably there to trigger memory. But because of that change with the meadow going around, she has memories um, of very different aspects of her life, playing with her mom during the spring along the amphitheater, having her first kiss on this path, or just a beautiful autumn day with her family and then sledding with her grandchild. And this concludes my presentation. Uh, yeah. The clap, the clap button just doesn't sort of. <laughs> it's not worthy. <laughs> um, Laura, can you say a little bit about um, why steel? I so I. The most important part was for it to have a color that contrasted to the pudding stone and have this very engineered element. And so in my knowledge of materials, powder coated steel is uh, one pretty resilient and then also allows for that pretty bright color. And but those are the important aspects of choosing that material. So if there's another one that is um, that I don't know about, I would love to hear about it. And uh, can you just say a little bit more about engineer, what engineered geology means? Sure. Because I think, um, I think it's hard for me to wrap my head around that. Um, like I, when I, when I hear those words and I, I sort of, when you're walking me through the presentation and sort of you're, you're noting that there aren't, um, uh, these fantastic geologic features um, that can be experienced and seen in this part of the park. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me like, you know, what, what I would think of as, as sort of a synthetic, um, uh, a synthetic kind of um, parallel um, to that, uh, to, to the natural geology might be quite different than what you're doing. So, mm. Um, yeah, how, how do you how do you understand engineered geology in the terms that you've yeah. employed it? I defined it as um, where the natural geology is like pro what we call natural processes have um, led to the Rossbury pudding stone. This is human made geology where the designer myself is sculpting the landscape in ways that um, nature has done in the past, and then also like barring your words, introducing a more synthetic material. So that's where the steel also comes into. 
Um, so having that contrast of um, what is naturally made and then having a very intentional human made um, read on the landscape. And I, I define that as engineered. But it's all engineering. Nature is also engineering, so. I had a similar question with the, uh, and I'm glad that you asked that and, uh, Laura, and Laura explained it. Um, I had a similar question with the engineered geology piece because it made me think that this project, you know, Franklin Park is a public park. Um, so for changes that would happen there, you know, it goes through a community engagement process, get mm -hmm. community feedback. And so I thought, you know, this would be an inter interesting project or presentation to think about how would I share this with the community? What would I ask them and what would they think? And I was kind of, I found myself wondering um, how the community, the Roxbury community on the east side would react to the idea of kind of, uh, we don't have original nature, so we have engineered nature. And it, you know, it just made me wonder, did you think about kind of if there is values to these or, um, or that question of, you know, kind of equity, I guess, across um, kind of creating this gradient and spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. So in the framework um, phase, the, the intention with circulation was really to simplify it, to connect the two sides very seamlessly. Um, and so my intention is that both, si both sides, meaning both the natural geology and the engineer geology side are as accessible to the communities that are closer to it. But um, because of the sheer size of the park, the everyday user might be more the person that is on the doorstep of that zone. So it was about making sure that both zones have a similar fantastical experience and highlight the role of materials in creating that enchantment, whatever they may be. Um, and you know, with Morton Rock being on that zone, that is why even though it's technically not engineered, it, I really wanted to highlight that because of the opportunity to actually highlight the one um, piece of Roxbury pudding stone that is on that edge. Um, and again, bringing diverse plantings and bringing like also natural elements that will make it so that they're, both sides are getting um, a sort of inertia and uh, an ecological experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I found your presentation to be, to use a word you just used, enchanting, um, you know, and, uh, and I, I really sort of bought into to a lot of the sort of references, um, you know, and, and this focus on uh, material. Um, but I have the same um, feeling that I had in the last project, which is that actually that's like an engineered geology is not really what your project is doing. Um, it's, it's not like, I, I feel like the, the things that you've actually created are, um, are maybe something else. Um, okay. And, you know, I, I think you're sort of like the, the, the title and the words that you're using are problematic, um, but also like not really what's been achieved. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, um, yeah, so I mean, talking about what your, your major moves, um, can you go back to the, the image of the bridge? Mm -hmm. This one or before? Um, my screen is just still on the last. Okay. Oh, here, it's moving now. Sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is just sort of like a general comment. I, I feel like people who know this site, but the, the other critics who know this site better than I do can probably speak more to, to the placement and, um, and to the, the, this idea of bridging um, this pond. Um, but I think that there's, there's sort of, um, your proposal could maybe be strengthened by an economy of means. Mm -hmm. um, I question whether you need to have this many crossings. Um, you know, it 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 uh, you know it 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 just it er erodes my trust a little bit in in sort of your 
um, determination of what, like, where exactly must this be? What is the what is the positioning of of somebody um, in relationship to that geological feature um, that makes it absolutely critical that the bridge must um, connect here and here across the pond? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and because there are multiple crossings. Um, and I think also just the angle of it um, in relationship to the to the connection points mm -hmm. um, makes me just wonder um, where that is. That said, like I, I mean, I think your your other drawings are compelling, and and this is like a, a really um, uh, an interesting idea, a, a new way of experiencing, um, you know, a water landscape. Um, it's, uh, it's something you can imagine people sort of falling in love, but I, I just don't know if, if they would, I don't know, it seems a little excessive. And then also the, um, the other intervention, um, you know, with the, the, the terracing, um, also feels like, um, I do, I'm wondering what the constraints around the design of that mm -hmm. were. Um, why that number of, of pieces, why that configuration, mm -hmm. um, why, you know, when they, when they sort of split off, you know, how many are there? Um, I, I, I would love to see some studies around that, um, again, to kind of like strengthen your proposal. And sure. more, you know, like to, to sort of give the assurance that now, like, it, it doesn't feel like the way it is is the way it must be. Okay. And I think, I think that that points to uh, maybe, maybe it's just sort of like undercooked um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of its development. Um, um, oh. Yeah, so um, to answer the, the decisions behind the bridging. Um, one is that this is the, again, circuit drive. Um, here, the angle makes it that with the angle of the rock, it's not actually the most um, like enchanting moment. Um, so it was about having a bridge that is um, of a smaller, like more individual scale. It's six feet wide, um, for, so that's pedestrian only, um, to have that experience with the rock. But because this, loop is bike um, and pedestrian and is wider and would connect the rest of the fabric, I thought it was important to keep that connection across the pond. So this is where that was rerouted so that it's not as, you know, as close as here, while keeping in line with the topography around the pond. And then this is an existing connection um, that there's a bridge already on here. Um, so it was about removing this one and then having two interventions that are more conducive to the new circulation. And then this, um, I did do a lot of studies with grading um, to make sure that there was an equilibrium of cut and fill. Um, I chose four or five terracing. I'm gonna go to here and move the video. Um, one, two, three, four, yeah, four with um, an area that's big enough for a speaker and then allowing also for recreational use between the um, old circuit drive and this amphitheater so that there was um, an invitation for groups to use the space. Um, and the amount of terracing was really from that uh, grading study. Um, and then same with the angle of the branching was about the natural topography uh, and also what is an ac acceptable length um, to have benching along the path because if it's too long, it's, it's gonna be overwhelming. So there was those decisions back and forth and it led to this configuration. So is that circuit drive that's at the bottom? It used of to be, slip? Yeah, so Circuit Drive used to do this whole loop. Um, and as you mentioned, this was a decision when cars were heavily brought into parks. And then in the 60s, they realized that the park was overrun with, car with cars. So instead of repurposing the roads, they put roadblocks along all the entryways that used to be for cars. So cars can't get in, but that infrastructure and that width is still just is as big as a road without like the separation of what where a pedestrian might go. So it's a little um, overwhelming, uh, but it would be a really great width if you were to redesign it as a really um, 
literal pedestrian and, and bike way. When I'm jump, I'll jump in just with a couple quick things. Um, I also do not buy the ecological or the, um, what is it, evolution and geology, whatever the engin engineer, engineer um, geology. Whatever, the, whatever the last one was. And I think it's a, a little bit the opposite of what we talked about before, where you're trying so hard to have a through line that's consistent that um, you sort of force, force, um, force a point. Um, but I think it's minor. Um, I, I also think that um, the the project that you zoomed into is maybe not yet as powerful as the rest of the presentation. And but honestly, I don't really care because the first part was so um, so beautiful and so unusual and so thoughtful, and the way you managed to like tie the arc of the volcano becoming the rock outcrop to the arc of an individual neighborhood um, resident is incredibly um, moving and um, uh, thoughtful. And can we go back to that section where you have the birds and the things and the... Yeah, but then we let, then we end up at an amphitheater. I know that's what we're saying. I don't I think it just it hurts me. Yeah. So I guess I would say like, I don't I'm not sure that you need nope, not that one. Um, oh. the, um, the the texture cross section. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I guess the thing I would argue is that you don't actually, you know, your contention there's there's a few contentions that I think are maybe not correct that you became because you so chose to cite your zoom in where you chose to cite it became like a little bit of a, a third rail and um you know you talk about how there's geology where the rock outcrops are and there isn't any geology down in the valley but that's not really true it's just that the geology is underground and it's in <laughs> granular and it's not a big rock outcrop and so i could have seen you doing anything that from like completely unbelievable, bold and unbelievable to like carving a big, like deep, deep path into the ground till you hit bedrock again and like siding that path with glass so that people could see the soil section all the way down to bedrock and be given this, you know, reverse, like reverse path to what they get at the um, rock outcrops near the um, Veridens to something that might be much more responsive to this where you're you're understanding the soil in all of these different places and it's a planting project um, that is tied to time and the seasons and and the multi um, dimensions of time that you're interested in from geologic to the life of a person to maybe the life cycle of a bug and um, that that's that's that the project is really more um, thoroughly flushed out around memory and markings and because you know you can say that the rocks don't change but lichen grows on them and mm -hmm. you know tiny little seat an acorn will find its way in there or sure. you know pine cone and like somehow a tree is going to be coming out 90 degrees to that slope 30 years from now and so there is mm -hmm. like termination and um you know, there's spray paint and there's, you know, there's just stuff that gets marked on the rocks and it's a different kind of time and change and, and memory vestige than what you might find in a meadow that is changing every year and going through a particular cycle. So I guess, you know, I agree completely with Phoebe that the, the project that got landed on is maybe not yet, you know, fully wringing the juice out of the incredible setup and all of your thinking, but um, I trust that you can get there. Just, I mean, when when you start going into making a space, like just let yourself, I mean, stay true to the idea, be as bold about it as you can. You can always take back. You can always make it more mm -hmm. normalized. Do not, not make any more amphitheaters ever in your <laughs> architecture career. And, you know, unless you absolutely are forced to, but really, you know, Give yourself, you know, see, understand the beauty of your idea and what inspired you and make sure that when you look at your project, you, you see it too, so that you're not really just, 
giving people a place to view that rock, although I think that's a great idea and I also want to take all of the vegetation off that side of it, but giving them a sense of, you know, running their hand along that rock in one place and really mm -hmm. understanding like wet, wet soil and what that makes in another place. And I think this image is this image combined with, you know, your, the arc of the woman and that, and that last picture where you're sort of overlay, you know, memory and landscape. Um, there's a really, really, really beautiful project in here. And it maybe is not in that last, you know, zoom in, but sure. it's great work. I wish you had been in our mid review because I love yeah. that idea. <laughs> well, Laura, I think it's funny. I, I do think um, I having like now I'm retreading where we came from. And at the mid review, there was this shift The Mark encouraged you to think about materiality and the relationship to time. And mm -hmm. it did sort of shift the project. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but it's just, um, uh, how do you narrate that and build it into the way? And so maybe the zones of the framework are suppressed because now it's really that you're understanding it's about this, it's exactly what everyone just said, the sort of uh, your interventions being a time, um, a measure of time, right? Mm -hmm. Or a barometer of change um, in landscape and cultural uh, mm -hmm. ways. And so, um, yeah, brilliant critics, you, you all. Yeah, I am, I mean, carving into the bedrock, I didn't even think about that, <laughs> and I'm like, dang it, because that's just beautiful, so. And I was trying to find it like a snazzy way, I was like, FPV or sounds so lame, is there something I can name it, and I didn't think of anything, and I think the problem was the FPV, <laughs> but yeah. It's a small thing. I think there was a lot of lovely uh, body skill and exploration there. I, and those little, the little drawings of the ways that a wall becomes a butts path, a butts meadow, a butts lawn, and the different kinds of body experiences you have of it. Those things I think are really um, spectacular and lovely. So yeah, and I don't I, see it as. I guess I just say I'm just not. I don't see it as just an amphitheater. I'll just defend the, a little bit of that. Well, okay, sorry. And, and I, I think like, I mean. Okay, steel's gonna get like really cold in the, you're not gonna wanna sit in it, on it in the winter time and then it's gonna get really hot, right? I mean, I, I don't yeah, know. Like I thought about that. It, it's also, I, I feel like, okay, if this project had been about like, okay, now I'm gonna use stone in this like really different way, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, I, I don't know, like I think, um, it really exploring stone as a material, um, not just the the um, the pudding stone that's there, but then this sort of you know designer's sensibility around stone. Um, and I yeah, like I, I love the idea of these like these huge like heavy things like getting embedded in the earth and and like that being a sort of um, a stage for people's lives. But you have to understand that an amphitheater is such an overused trope and, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's like, did someone ask? That's why I was like, did someone just like, was there some investigation that, that um, where there were findings that this community really had to have an amphitheater? <laughs> um, or, you know, like, why is there a road at the bottom of the amphitheater? Like, you know, I mean, I, I'm like someone who believes if you do something fantastically well, you can legitimize it, even if it's mm -hmm. it's like a tired trip. Um, but it isn't convincing in the way that it's designed or it's material exploration. So be careful of the be careful of how you uh, the the ideas that you tie back to. And mm -hmm. so if, if you're going to tie back. Um, you know, to your original sources around material, materiality, mm -hmm. then you're, you know, but your project isn't actually about materiality. You know, that's why I said, why steel? Because mm -hmm. I thought maybe there was some like really deep thinking around steel. Um, but as it's like, as you've designed these elements, um, it doesn't seem like it, nor does steel seem particularly you know, related to the idea of geology. Um, so I, 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 like I second that your, your drawings and your presentation are beautiful and 
you know, but I, I think the through line has to be actually quite tight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have, you have some, some places where it kind of is leaking out a little bit, mm -hmm. um, where you're sort of losing the through line. Okay. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Molly. Hi. Hi. Are you ready to? Okay. Yes. One second. Thanks. Okay. So, um, hi, I'm Molly. Um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, my analysis of Franklin Park through the lens of topography. Um, but really what it kind of became was a uh, reconsideration of the park's um, high points um, in relation to their adjacent communities. So I'm calling it Porch Peak and Power. So looking at the site initially, um, I had done some analysis of the history um, in terms of what Olmsted looked at at topography. Um, so initially, you know, he had uh, taken a look at the topo survey at the time and identified several of the high points. And his intention, it seemed, was to create uh, kind of destinations um, that focus on an interior experience of the park mostly. Um, and looking at kind of what that looks like today, um, a lot of really interesting kind of topographical destinations occur at the western edge of the park along the kind of J Jamaica Plain side, um, but the eastern side uh, is kind of lacking in destinations and the experience that's really interesting of the pudding stone and the, the co contrast between high and low. Um, so that was kind of what I took from the analysis of um, his intentions, um, thinking about what I wanted to do for my framework and my site. And in, in the site analysis, um, a lot of the issues uh, have to do with boundary. So there are um, you know, physical, social, uh, visual boundaries that restrict access kind of to and through the park. Um, the boundaries are not porous, which affects um, some communities more than others. Um, and there's a lot of visual access issues um, to really cool and special places um, that uh, are kind of constricted by overgrowth and um, a lot of neglect. Uh, so these kind of show those issues. And then, you know, thinking about the redesign of, of these places, I wanted to consider some community kind of influences uh, that are contemporary. Um, so I looked at different activists and writers that are from the area and distilled kind of some principles uh, to guide my space making or the way I was thinking about the site in some way. Um, so I distilled uh, three kind of ideas of perspective, agency, and self-determination. And so my framework plan um, from that thinking resulted in this idea of uh, creating new topographical destinations along the eastern edge of the park, um, because I saw that side as being kind of neglected. Um, and it focuses on creating um, these, these five new topo rooms which receive edge communities. So it's meant as spaces that pair with an adjacent community. Um, it also focused on enhancing uh, five existing destinations um, and then also a, another main move was that it proposed a kind of loop, uh, which is like a, a revisited uh, uh, circuit loop um, that would connect the edges more so than the interior. Um, so thinking about a focus area, I selected one of these nodes or one of the new Eastern uh, destinations uh, to explore at the site scale. Um, and the, the node that I explored is actually uh, a node um, where Olmsted had uh, some inter interventions as well. It was called Refectory Hill, um, and it encompassed kind of a, a, a um, high point um, and, and, and a building called uh, the library or the refectory, and it was meant kind of as a place to see and be seen. So um, as time went on, it kind of was neglected, and, and I see the idea of um, this site as a, a revisit of his original intentions. Um, but it sits along a pretty busy corridor right now. There are a lot of kind of small businesses and um, a lot of traffic um, that goes down Blue Hill Ave where it's located. Um, but this is also a great opportunity to kind of have a, a visual access both into the park um, and out of the park. Uh, so that's kind of where the site is situated. 
And then the concept um, I wanted to make a park, a, a space that was focused on um, these kind of three principles that I've listed here. Um, and since my concept for the site is about um, social power through high points in the park, um, these three uh, principles kind of guide that thinking. Um, and, you know, gardens have meant power and high points have meant power at different times throughout history, but I wanted this feeling to be a little bit different. Um, so first, representation. Um, the space is designed to be open-ended and flexible. Um, it's also designed to be visible within the neighborhood so that you can see the space um, and see out. Uh, second includes ideas of intimacy and assembly. So, you know, power can come from um, gathering, but it also can come from kind of quiet reflection and intimacy. And then third perspective. Um, so I wanted to, you know, make sure I'm relating to Olmsted's vision of a country park and having respite within the city, but also I see it as equally important to create perspective about the place's relationship kind of within the community. So both looking inwards and looking outwards. And that thinking kind of resulted in this um, site design, which um, has essentially an idea about an interior room and an exterior room, which I'm calling the porch and the peak. So on the right side of, um, of the site plan on the eastern edge uh, is the porch room, um, which is meant to be an outward focusing uh, room that receives traffic from Blue Hill Avenue, um, but it is also meant to be a gathering space from, um, the for the Dorchester community. So you can see that there's a kind of sloping up to a high point on the edge um, that exists right now, but isn't really utilized. And it has kind of terrace seating to be able to um, experience this idea of seeing and being seen much the way that Olmsted had in mind actually when he designed the refectory building. Um, next, um, this kind of path, which is sinuous um, and leads you down to um, the second room, I'm calling the procession, and it's actually meant to change in character so that when you're coming from the porch, you have a more linear experience and you're seeing actually the parking lot of the uh, uh, current clubhouse. So it's a more public facing path. And then as it reaches um, the second room, it becomes more sinuous to have this kind of reflective experience. And then it arrives at the room, which I'm calling the peak, um, which is meant to be the interior experience of the park, um, something that's meant for more quiet reflection and intimacy rather than um, communal gathering um, as the porch is. And the peak overlooks um, the current uh, golf course, which is um, partially converted into a meadow at this point. I envision the golf course still existing as nine holes, um, but at this point uh, being kind of a restored meadow, um, but also having a, a relationship to the clubhouse as it's even right now a community space. Um, so I wanted to keep it kind of intact. So looking closer at the peak, um, this is again an experience that's meant to be uh, more intimate and meant for kind of meditation and reflection. Um, so the path getting to the peak is intended to have a feeling of compression and then release when you see the view. So what you're seeing here is the kind of path leading to the view. Um, and one kind of uh, element that runs throughout the whole uh, project is this idea of a seating area which would change um, at different points to accommodate all user groups and different kinds of um, seating. So here you can see sometimes it moves um, in tier into two tiers to create a, a more commu a communal gathering. Um, and then at most points along the peak, since it's meant for the singular experience, um, it becomes just one single bench. It also breaks up um, for uh, vegetation at different points. And then it also um, pinches um, to make room for like more of embedded ADA access so that you can feel that you're within the, the kind of bench or uh, seating area, but not um, separate from it. In section, um, you can see how right now there's kind of a lot of overgrowth. Um, there's a, 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 you know, a high point that exists right now, but you don't perceive that at all. And the, the circulation leading to the um, room doesn't exist in any meaningful way right now. So I'm focusing on exposing kind of this as a high point, um, creating uh, this sinuous seating to allow for um, a, an idea of one, one intervention that's um, giving uh, ideas of intimacy. And then the separation of the path from the seating also allows for this idea of being uh, by yourself and being able to be reflective. Um, so the grading around the path leading up to the seating um, is meant to be kind of mounded so that you have this, again, feeling of compression and release and also a separation from 
um, those who are seated. Um, at a closer uh, level, you can see here how the seating might change to accommodate for more of a lounging condition versus a sitting upright or um, slightly backwards. And then again, it, it kind of um, expands into two, two tiers at certain points um, to allow for people who are coming as a group. Um, but again, the, the body scale interventions meant for um, this idea of reflecting and lounging. And then from the view, you can see um, into the interior of the park over the meadow, maybe to Scarborough Pond or Scarborough Hill, some other landmarks at the park. Um, but you could also probably see into the um, southern end, to, so the Mattapan community. Um, and again, it's supposed to give you this idea of um, experience of an interior of the park, but also a connection to the outside. So at the porch um, site, we have um, this idea of terrace seating. Um, with kind of a lawn on the northern side. Right now, um, Blue Hill Ave is really busy, so I wanted to include an idea of expanding the sidewalk to accommodate the bus stop that's right there. Um, so the seating is more oriented to sitting upright and gathering its terraces to accommodate for large groups to gather. Um, but it's the same idea of it contracting and expanding to accommodate many different user groups. Um, and the idea here is that it would be prominent on the street so you could see into the park and give um, or get an idea of porosity more than you can right now. So the section shows how, again, it's um, graded as a retaining wall right now, but that would be exposed to allow for the terrace seating. Um, and the terrace seating exists uh, at the very top um, and it breaks into vegetation with several benches in the middle. Um, so it's not equally terraced throughout, but there is this idea of it changing um, and contracting ex and expanding. And then um, going to the next slide, the ideas are a bit different here at the body scale. So, you know, as it's receiving traffic and people are waiting for the bus or um, gathering in large groups, there's more of a sitting upright and leaning condition than exists at the peak. Um, so the body scale changes um, here as well. And then you'd be able to see into the community um, at the porch site. So you're seeing the you know, family market, um, the school that's right across the street, the bus uh, route, um, you're seeing into Dorchester um, where there are other schools and kind of uh, church landmarks in that community. So again, it's meant to be um, community facing. And then this just explores the ideas of the body um, being comfortable and the ideas of care that we talked about in the studio. So I looked at you know, different seat angles and um, edges of the seats that are you know, creating an idea of being comfortable in a place. Um, so from these kind of studies, I distilled them into the um, body scale interventions um, at both the porch and the peak. And then this is a loose study of, the, of where these uh, seating elements would change. Uh, so in orange, you can see how I tried to evenly break up the ADA uh, uh, points in the bench so that you have, or you're taking it, you're able to take advantage of every view possible as someone um, who is in a wheelchair. And then the idea of the different blue colors is that um, as uh, the blue gets darker, there's uh, more of a lounging condition, or sorry, the opposite. As it gets lighter, there's more of a lounging condition. So at the peak room, there's more lounging spaces and as you get onto the second tier, you have a more upright experience. And then conversely at the porch, you're more upright most of the time with a lounging condition at the top. So it's kind of an opposite experience since um, you know, there's an idea of intimacy versus assembly. And then I wanted to kind of end on this idea of the procession or the breaking points to get into the park. Um, I uh, have this idea of you know, the, the kind of path between these two places being um, a place as well where you could gather at some points, um, but exposes the edge so that you can actually uh, get into the park. Um, and this I'd like to explore in more detail, but um, I just think it's a good representation of kind of what I'm getting after in terms of community um, uh, entering the park. So that's it. I'll put it back on a plan.
I think, um, you know, just out of the out of the gate, I, I was thinking the whole time that you were presenting, maybe from the beginning, about the idea about um, if if the high point being power and what that meant and what that meant for this park too. Um, and you know, in Boston, I think that that is a true thing. I guess in in uh, Austin too, right? You guys have like the um, the Capitol, which is the you can't build above the Capitol. Um, the height limits with that. Boston, known as City on the Hill, um, the State House sits there, and um, so there there are sort of broader cultural meanings to that too. But I think there's something really um, nice too in like celebrating the low. And I wonder if there's um, there is like a fourth P for you around the patio. Um, that could be this other place that has a really different type of experience. This isn't, um, and I, I think it's relevant because one of the places that I think the most about that is the back side of the clubhouse, um, mm -hmm. where there is this kind of really special, you know, the clubhouse number three on your map. Um, there is this kind of special back patio where you get this huge open view across the park um, of, of that kind of valley. And it's this sort of social place that, um, you know, there is something special that happens in the clubhouse and with uh, as, as challenging as golf courses are for many other reasons, you know, there is this kind of social dynamic and that, and that place and that view is nice. So it, it was really interesting to me to think about then that juxtaposed with your peak and the power and all of, all of that. Cause I, I think so much about that kind of that view through the low, um, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I, I could see also the idea of the patio happening other places too. And um, not just about kind of bringing, bringing topography to this side, but also bringing some experience of that kind of intimacy, the, um, the picnicking that people really like to do and the barbecues to the east side. Yeah, um, I, you know, in doing the rendering for it, actually, I was thinking it would be great if there was another P that I had for like a, the low point or the, even the meadow, or if there was a, a logical way to connect them. And I did a lot of thinking about the connection to the clubhouse too. So I think that that could go further. Um, so yeah, that's a really good idea. Are you retaining the golf course or is the proposal to um, get rid so, of the golf course and transform it to meadow? So I, my proposal is to get rid of part of the golf course. The, the actual clubhouse would remain for that purpose. Um, but the point right here where you're seeing number two, um, where the meadow is, that part would be converted to a meadow. So you're seeing not the golf course right there, but the golf course portion at the south end of the site would still exist. Does the golf course serve uh, the neighboring communities? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that, you know, it, it, I don't have a really great plan view of it, but um, yeah, it definitely serves the community um, and it's, you know, pretty old historic golf course as well. So I wanted to preserve it, a piece of it, but I think that it could function, you know, in, in a, um, it's still a function in a way to have just nine holes instead of 18. Um. I'll jump in. Um, I think, you know, there's some really beautiful things about this project and I, I, I especially appreciate how you kind of, um, you know, how you found entry into your thinking and the kind of research that you did into um, women um, in these neighborhoods who had been advocates um, and um, and then that image for the, can you go back to the conceptual, I don't know if there were sections or whether they were elevations or you were just on it. I, I have a super big delay. So I've been like trying to catch up between oh, no. what I, your slides are showing and what your voice is saying. So I just, yeah, there we go. Um, and I think that to me, this is where, um, I guess I have a few thoughts about maybe some tweaks that I would make to the expression of the project for your consideration. And I, I think what's, mm -hmm. what's especially strong about this set of studies is the way that the reality of kind of the urban context and the, re and the sort of pastoral reality of the park are equally present. And, um, and there's a richness and a trueness to that that I think is quite beautiful. Um, 
there's also, you know, if we go and talk about the porch, there's also like the triple decker, which is, you know, classic Boston housing fabric and, you know, porch on every floor and the porches that, you know, look onto the street or they look onto the back alleys or they look onto the train tracks or, you know, it's just very present um, sort of housing um, and living typology in Boston. And I, I guess I wish, if, can we go back to your plan now? I would have loved to mm -hmm. have seen a couple things. I would have loved to have seen, this is ignoring all the great things in your project. The, I would love to have seen what might have, um, how you would have explained the spaces you were making if they were, if they grew out of some of the um, um, advocacy of the women that you started with, like how that mm -hmm. those um, those people who had inspired you, what they what they understood about what their communities had or didn't have, how that narrative would have found its way into how the porch and the peak and the um, and the what's the other one? What's the other one? Because it's both peak on here. The procession. The procession. Yeah, the I actually five. just realized. Yeah. Yeah, number five. Um, and and maybe not even number five, but but the the porch and the peak might have been reflective of something that you really discovered about the neighborhood and the legacy of those women since you had done some looking into um, them as inspiration. And then mm -hmm. um, I think the porch in particular was an opportunity for maybe you to do something that was um, more urban um, mm -hmm. and there were walls, there, there was a mural there, or maybe you actually had shade structures and it wasn't about tree canopy, it was about architecture and you're kind of talking about the, you know, without copying it or being, you know, postmodern about it, but you were, you were somehow referencing like how people were living in the neighborhood and making that edge um, an opportunity for the neighborhood to sort of, to have a conversation with that edge of the park. Um, so that the places were less sisters and more cousins, that there's a sort of mm -hmm. similarity how the bench is deployed and how you, the elements that you're using space to space. And I think the thinking is deep and rich and the ability to craft space is strong. And maybe you the, the, that sort of three-tiered vision that you started with could have found its way into the project a little more definitively so that as you moved from the most urban edge to maybe the most rural edge you mm -hmm. uh, were reflecting some of the observations that were in that um in, in those elevations and i have one other small thought because this is a particularly beautiful place and um where you have kind of multiple hillsides and there's uh, or knolls there's one there's where am i um i don't know where it went I don't have it, but there's on the bottom, middle bottom, there's another knoll there. And I just wondered about if the peak, uh, sorry, yeah, if the peak were happening sort of across the valley so that we were having a conversation between spaces where you could see people across that gap um, and maybe, you know, there would be a sort of interior theater there as well, because I do think that the sense of that you're, what you're talking about people understanding each other and knowing each other, there's sort of some ways that some of those themes could have made it, you know, spatially into the, um, mm -hmm. the work. But I think that all of the like incredibly deep work that you did on how people are gonna be comfortable with seating and um, how beautifully you've graded things and really thought about this experience pro procession from the neighborhood to something that is quieter is quite beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, Molly, um, I, I think Kristen made some really great comments um, and um, that I agree with. Um, and, you know, your drawings are really expressive and beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and it, it's a lovely project. Um, I think I just have some sort of specific points um, or questions. Um, particularly because this drawing is up, um, you know, I think uh, this question of um, difference across the project, and you talked about it a little bit, um, you know, you talked about sort of intimacy versus, um, you know, sort of a, more of a, a social um, sort of outward project, uh, like projecting outwardly. 
um, to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I know it's in your thinking, but in terms of um, what you've designed, there seems to be a little bit of an evenness, evenness that Kristen just pointed out, um, maybe between porch and peak, but I see it even um, within the individual elements, um, like the porch, um, the, the sort of side facing the neighborhood and the side facing the park. Um, you know, th there is a kind of evenness across um, that mm -hmm. the, the form because it, it is, it's, it's a wrapping form. Um, and it feels like it should have a different attitude towards the urban fabric than it does towards the interiority of the park, or it should be oriented in a way that um, that projects a real attitude. Um, and then the peak, I just I, like I'm not sure about its orientation, projecting over over um, the golf course. Um, I think I have to dig a little deeper um, into my own personal baggage to understand why that <laughs> makes me <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, but you know, like I, I think like the directionality. Um, and, and the difference, even the, um, <clears throat> the, the meandering path, right? You have two equal um, sort of forms as it, as it weaves through the figure eight, you know, um, mm -hmm. um, as, you, as you get close to the peak. Um, so I, I just, I think those are areas um, or ways that it could be strengthened um, mm -hmm. and, and sort of made even deeper. I, I think the also the just like graphically the porch. I feel like the the porch should be um, maybe more kind of expansive um, mm -hmm. than the peak, and it, and it, and it is. But the graphics, like the white and the the green, sort of gets lost right as part of the porch to mm -hmm. me. And I you see it as that small white form. So I mean, I, I if I do a little if I do a little bit more work to understand it. Um, without the drawings, um, I, I can see that it, it, it really is sort of like reaching out um, mm -hmm. um, to that primary entrance um, or sort of like embracing um, that whole area. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, um, again, like I, I think you all are doing some, some fantastic argument building. Um, and, and sort of drawing connections to things that are specific to place, um, but then how much they, they're actually driving your, your design decisions um, is a question. And so, mm -hmm. you know, like Kristen pointed out, the, the, the sources of the uh, community leaders and, um, or um, community activists, artists, poets, writers, um, you know, like how, like how does that, I, I think a good question to ask is like, how does that influence like what I'm actually making in the landscape? Like what, mm -hmm. uh, what I'm designing and what is the relationship there? Um, mm -hmm. Because it, you know, it, it seems like it sort of instigated some thinking, but then, um, but then didn't, didn't really go much further than that. It, you know, Molly, mm -hmm. we talked a lot about, um, CAD jail in the last few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Molly would make great, great progress when she went to research or to her hand drawings. And then it was, it always felt like you were trying to then bring that energy into the land of the computer drawing. Yeah. It's hard. And I think, um, I think Maggie told you to go, to continue to go back and look and show those hand sketches because they're um, so much, so much more expressive. And, and your whole life, you'll be challenged to figure out how to bring expressive quality that you do by hand, which is so much more free, mm -hmm. into this digital delivery system that we all use. And so um, you can just see it, though. You can see like the the, the um, sort of constraints mm -hmm. of, the, of the of the even offset and the ease of making two lines that are parallel leads to a, a kind of um, even reading that I think uh, Phoebe's. Really mm -hmm. But I, I guess that was a long way of saying, you know, like you, there's so much energy in the way you thought about this that was so incredible and beautiful and the way you represented it by hand. And so just to keep working on how do you make that hand um, land, mm -hmm. you know, in, in uh, the design moves. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think even when I was rendering the plan, I had this thought of like, oh, 
it seems like the portion of feet are too similar in a lot of ways. And, you know, at that point, like even when you start to render things, you realize. So um, I think when I, if I, you know, when I revisit, um, I had a lot of the same thoughts already. So thank yeah. you. It was interesting to see too, I think, you know, all the projects and this is probably in the brief kind of move through scales from kind of looking, looking broadly and widely, whether that's in time or, you know, the city and understanding that and then zooming in ultimately to these kind of uh, really small scale bodies studies. But I think it's important mm -hmm. after that to then go back big again. Um, and maybe that would get at a little bit of what Phoebe was looking for, which was how does, how do these kind of site interventions affect the whole and how would that affect your your framework and how would that you know affect your thesis um so to kind of keep going back and forth instead of just um you know going right. in the direction yeah okay thank you thank you molly all right Whew. Can you all sh show yourself for a hot minute? Hello. Congratulations. <laughs> that, that was it. Woo. Is this whole video? Congratulations on four, four years down. Thank you. Are you done with Thank finals you. and everything too? Or is this the end? Oh, no. no, there's more. Okay, never mind. Never mind. We have we have oh, finals yeah. for other classes next week. Yeah. But most of us um, are graduating. So this was our final final. <laughs> Congrats, everybody. Congratulations, you guys. I enjoyed our studio. It was so great working with you. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, you, know, you guys, um, thanks for bearing with what has to be the strangest semester of school I've ever been part of. <laughs> <laughs> I know I I know Phoebe and I have had this exchange via text that just we feel very robbed of our of our time that we were going to have together um, through this pandemic. But I'm so grateful to you, Phoebe, and to you, Maggie, um, for for being such exquisite uh, models of great teaching. Um, and to you, Bree and Kristen, thank you so much for taking a big chunk of your time today to look at this work. I'm really proud. I think the students got exceptional feedback today. It was really strong. Oh, hello. It was oh, so fun. And I'm so ready to steal so many of these ideas. So <laughs> we're moving into design. And now I have a lot of wind behind, you know. Our <laughs> yeah. Really and it's, uh, really you know, it's, it, it's interesting because, um, uh, you know, I, um, I, uh, I haven't taught in a long time. And um, when Maggie wanted to share her research topic of feminist theory, it's just, I, I know you guys have heard me say this before, but it's so been so wonderful for me to see someone think about that from a way other than through this practice lens that Brie and I talk about it a lot and think yeah. about it more from a theoretical perspective. And I, I believe the work is different for that conversation. I believe the work is different from just the um, demographic makeup of the studio and that you've had along the way and the kinds of other voices that were brought into the conversation. But I hope you all, um, yeah, feel like it was a really worthwhile use of time in this last semester for some of you. Maggie, do you want to share any thoughts on the review? Well, this was such a great conversation and I just am so grateful to all the critics for making time and also, um, I mean, Gina, you said this about halfway through, but just the uh, having critics that are able to just see the um, the bones of the conversation that we've been having throughout the semester and um, and then also wishing that we could look at the hundreds of drawings that explained the thinking you know two months ago that um, was dealing with the question that came up today and wishing we could go back in time and start start over um, although I'm sure you're all ready to be done um, <laughs> it um, it was it was really it was really great to see the work and um, also just to reflect on how far these projects have come in such a short period of time. So, I just thank you all for uh, sticking with it and um, figuring out new ways to work uh, without the studio environment that you're used to working in. It's pretty impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. Bree and Kristen, any closing thoughts as our our visitors today? 
And Phoebe, I guess Phoebe. Let's do the first. Who goes uh, first? I'll go. Am I unmuted? Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't. I was just very impressed um, all all day, and um, you know, it's a really tough problem. I think it's it's a daunting place to take on. It has so many histories within it, and so many decisions have been made that have really undermined it as a place. And there are so many challenges. And I think each and every one of you, um, like found the thing that you were interested in and you know grappled with it head on and it wasn't like oh it, if I look at one more you know salt marsh project I'm gonna like poke myself in the eyeball you know everybody's was really so individual to their own um you know motivations as you know young women and landscape architects and what they took away from the park and the research and I really appreciated that and made for a great conversation and I, I also really appreciated the way you even if it wasn't always perfect, the way you kind of built the defense of your project and the clarity of the thinking and the clarity of um, the way, the drawings that you used to describe how you got to the work. And you had such a short time to develop the actual design work that, I mean, I wouldn't even worry about if it didn't end up where you wanted it to end up because the depth of that thought and clarity of the passion um, you know, hopefully the conversation gave you um, an opportunity to to think about how you would tweak it and where you want to go next. But the most important thing about school, I think, is um, to really to start to develop your own voice as a landscape architect. You're going to go out, you're going to work for lots of people they are going to try to, you know, you're going to be working for them. You're going to have to look at the work in part through the way that the office looks at the work. And it's a constant process of figuring out where your voice sits and where their voice sits and how to make sure that your voice is always in the conversation. So I, I just think you all are on um, a really good track for being able to do that. And I appreciate you sharing your work with, with us today. Thanks. And I'll just add, um, I'm sorry that there's a tiny person finding her voice around me right now. Um, you <laughs> might hear her again. Um, but I think you know, exactly what Kristen said in terms of the um, breadth of the work. It was so interesting to see how you tackle some of the questions that we're thinking about um, exactly right now, too, and um, made me think about some, some things in particular differently. I think everyone identified kind of that east-west um, split, both in the um, interior of the park and then, of course, the communities around. Um, but, you know, certain things like Catherine's um, trail that went right up the center. Um, I'd never kind of thought about the impact of that connection. Um, and then also starting to think a lot more about um, the area around the maintenance yards, Scarborough Pond, all the different kind of scenarios we got to see for that. Um, really helpful and sort of like underexplored areas for us so far because we've been really focused on kind of community experience and it's everywhere but um, those places. So really helpful to kind of see already ahead to, to how you've thought about that. Um, and I think, you know, for each of you too, that um, you thought so clearly about kind of what is my framework and then where, where do I use that? Where do I apply that? Um, that's a really, really helpful way to connect kind of the um, social impact that you're trying to have to kind of physical design. And so I think that was a really, um, came through very clear in your presentations too, um, the kind of commitment to uh, community and, and to kind of the um, social or um, other benefits that might might have. And, you know, with, with a lot of them, there's always the question of kind of like, what can Franklin Park do, you know, when it comes to homelessness, when it comes to public health, what's the role of this place? Um, and I think you all kind of tested the waters and the edges of that. So that was, that was great to see what, what you all thought it could do. Um, can I just say a couple of things? Um, so I, I taught many of you a year ago and I can't believe how far you've come. Um, like it's, it's just, these projects are amazing. And I looked at all of them, the ones from this morning too, um, even though I wasn't um, a reviewer. Um, and, you know, just even looking at the, um, the drawings without 
the benefit of your presentation. I could understand the project. I was amazed by the work, the depth of the thinking um, and the sophistication, um, sort of integrating um, so, so, many, so many different facets. I mean, that's what makes landscape architecture so gratifying, um, right? It's, it's I, I feel like it's, it's something where you're never, you can never be bored. Um, it's so complex and rich. Um, and um, I, I agree, each of your projects kind of evidences you as people, you as thinkers, you as designers. Um, and my comments today on the, the projects that I reviewed are um, like comments to, to colleagues, not to students. Like I think as students, you sort of surpassed um, my expectations, but now as colleagues, you, you have more development because design, you know, bec becoming a, um, a fossil designer, it takes time. It just takes a lot of time. Um, it's not a it's not a, a profession where you do three three years of school and and that's it. I think there's sort of a, a kind of apprenticeship period um, after school where there's still so much learning. Um, it's just in a different um, context. Um, and as Kristen said, um, it's a context where um, you know you're not developing your own projects. Um, uh, for better or worse. Um, and so it's important to kind of uh, stay in touch with what's, what's really important to you. Um, and, um, you know, take what you can um, from the offices you work in, um, contribute all you can, um, and keep moving. So thank you so much. Um, oh, also, I wanna say you guys are really lucky to have had Gina and Maggie. Um, I, I, I kind of wish I had been able to be, um, you know, a, a, a bystander <laughs> through this semester because um, yeah, just fantastic um, to have the opportunity to have a studio with both of them um, and you know, the, the project, both the project and the kind of lens that you were given um, is, um, is timely, um, mm -hmm. really. Um, thank so you. thank you to you for teaching. So good, so good. Thank so you, grateful. Gina. So really grateful to all of you. Sleep well this weekend. Yeah. Yes. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's been great. Congratulations. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Yay.